And women cannot be written out of history. through her church and in the 1970s gained experience as a union farm worker and organizer with the United Farm Workers. She is credited with co-founding the women's farm working movement in California. Yeah. She is the founder and vice president of Alianza Nacional de Campesinas, a national farm worker women's alliance representing 15 farm worker organizations and groups. She sits on numerous state and national boards, state and national advisory councils and task force representing Latinas, the farm worker community, and immigrant women in general on health, education, violence against women, labor and women rights, environmental and gender issues. She also co-founded Mujeres Mexicanas in the Coachella Valley, and in 1992, with the support of the CRLA Foundation, she also co-founded Lideres Campesinas the first state-based farm worker women's unique grassroots organization that became a statewide movement of campesina leaders advocating on behalf of campesinas, from farm worker women to farm worker women. She is advisory MAPA member to the National Sexual Violence Resource Center. Since 2015, she's a member of the National Environmental Justice Advisory Council, NEJAC, to the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency. She also sits on the boards of California Latina for Reproductive Justice and the Rural Coalition. She consults for and with various statewide and national organizations that focus on social, environmental, worker justice, reproductive justice, and violence against women issues. She also provides technical assistance and capacity building to farmers that are socially disadvantaged, like Pequeños Agricultores de California and the National Hmong American Farmers to ensure socially disadvantaged farmer members are trained in business and labor regulations. Amazing, right? Just amazing. Currently, she is working in the Bandana Project, a domestic violence campaign aimed at raising awareness about the exploitation of farm worker women, as well as the Coming Clean Project, which is focused on bringing attention to the environment with regards to pesticide and pollutant harms. In 2018, she joined the fourth cohort of the movement to end violence under Novo Foundation. She was honored by Lideres Campesinas for her 30 plus years of distinguished leadership. How great is that? She has won numerous, numerous awards for her tireless efforts, including 100 Heroines of the World and the Cesar Chavez Legacy Award. In 2016, the World Women's Summit Foundation recognized her as one of the nine laureates given the prize for women's creativity in rural life. So most recently, she did receive an award, the Legacy Award, at the 2018 Cesar E. Chavez Scholarship event at Moreno Valley College. So, I mean, I can go on and on and on, but 
I'll let her talk to you guys. So for, without further ado, please let, help me welcome Ms. Millie Trevino Sauceda. Híjole, gracias. Um, how are we doing? Lunch was good? Yes, okay. I recently, I've loved starting with the unity clap. Who, who knows about the unity clap? Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna show it at the beginning and then I'm gonna say, um, everybody knows about saying si se puede, se puede, something like that, verdad? Right? And then in English, que decimos? Can we do it? Yes, we can, all right? And then towards the end, if I don't do the clap, you remind me. Está bien? Okay. And then uh, you can clap me if you want me to finish. All right? Okay. Okay. My conversation. Ah. Okay. Let's, let's do the clap. Let me, let me show it first, okay? You go. All right, <clears throat> thank you very much. Thank you, Francis. Thank you, Dr. Enrique. Thank you, all the people, wonderful people um, uh, that are very, very supportive. And the people that, you know, all together made this happen. This is a success. It's great. Uh, I love it. Uh, ever since, you know, as we've walked in, I, I do have my mom here with me, and I thank uh, everybody that greeted us, my mom and my sister, Veronica, at one of our, our, our one of the 10 children, I'm the second, you know, uh, and my nephew, Adrian, uh, they wanted to accompany me. So, muchas gracias uh, por estar aquí. Yeah. My mom has a long history also, and this is why I am who I am. Chingona. <laughs> okay, gracias. Um, they asked me if I could, um, I could share a little bit about my history. I'm a good organizer, but I don't know anything about technology, so sorry about this. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay, good, good. And um, I'm used to, I'm a, I'm a migrant. I was born as a migrant and I will continue being a migrant, so I'm everywhere all the time. So um, bear with me if I'm walking around, I'm so used to it. But I'm, se I'm serious, I'm, I'm so used to it. Um, because if I don't, then yo me aburro sola. Yeah, yeah. So as, as I was introduced by Francis, I, I do come from a migrant pharmacal family. Um, it, it was hard. It was a hard life for all of us, the children that lived uh, migrating from, from one area to another. Yes, we're 10 children. Some of us were born in the, in the state of Washington. Others were born in the state of Idaho. Others were born in Mexico. And we ended up in California, so we ended up traveling, um, um, migrating to find jobs. And uh, there were times that we did live in our cars because it was very hard to get a place for 12 people. And then the places that we would find were places were in really bad substandard conditions. So all of that together, it was very, very hard. Um, and then as we all know, farm workers, because we were not under the Fair Labor Standards Act in the 60s, 70s, and we still are not uh, nationwide. Um, since n 1938, the Fair Labor Standards Act is in effect for all industries except for some, which includes 
the domestic workers, farm workers, and farm workers. California, because of the United Farm Workers Movement, we do have um, regulations and, and, and we are included because there, there also exists the, the same way there's the National Labor Relations Board for all other industries. Um, uh, the Agricultural Labor Relations Board exists in California. So during the time when Cesar um, Dolores Huerta and Gilberto Padilla organized in the 60s and then the 70s, came to California in the 70s. And we, we learned about the importance of organizing and um, we didn't understand as farm workers the importance of organizing at the beginning. It was more because we didn't work in the grapes and the union was organizing more in the grapes. And, um, I, and I wanna tell this real quick, just because my familia is, is um, organizadora, we're all organizers. And yo más soy la más descarriada, you know, I'm, I'm the one that's <laughs> everywhere, no? Este, but we do, we ended up learning a lot from the, U, the United Farm Workers. Uh, there were certain flaws that, that, that did happen because the union was not ready for many things uh, during the 70s. And this is the time when, and that we, we were around. And I will always say we learned from the union organizing. I learned to be an organizer uh, through that. I learned to be an organizer through the youth groups that were organized. And I, I wanna give credit to Rosa Marta Zarate, whomever knows she's around here. And, and this is because during the time uh, that I was a youth, uh, she was organizing youth groups with Father Patricio. And um, we were very strong Catholics. Uh, well, we still are. But uh, we, we were during that time and um, she helped us understand the importance of organizing within the church. And that was very important for us to the point that I was one of, of 10 youth that were taken with the support of them, um, taken to uh, Colombia for two months. Never, never in my life I had been away from my family. And then being away for two months in another country was like, ooh, but I loved it. <laughs> I loved it and I said, you know, this, and, but it was on leadership development and it was a lot of things that at the time I didn't know I was gonna use all those, uh, everything that I learned and I've been using it. So it's very, very good. So we're, I, I wanted to mention that because she's around, at least I want her to know that we really appreciate all the hard work that she did during those years. Um, I, I also wanted to share that, for example, yes, I, as a campesina, because we call ourselves campesinos, campesinas, verdad? As a campesina, I didn't see myself as like, oh, yo soy una campesina. You know, we, I saw myself as a worker. Hard labor, we love to work. Um, we were working, I worked more uh, picking lemons. Who has worked in the fields? Raise your hands. Good. Some of you are gonna understand what I'm gonna say. Working in the agricultural fields, especially working picking lemons, you had this long sacks, sacos as we call them in Spanish, and you're, you're getting on ladders. You have to carry the ladder around the tree and then you have to put it in a certain way. So if not, you fall. And I fell many times, you know. So filling the sack, it weighed 70 pounds. You have to fill seven, 17, 16, 17 sacks to fill the VIN. And the first year I could only, every day I could only fill two VINs during the day. And I was exhausted. By the fifth year, I was competing with my brothers, filling five, six vins in and, and less than eight hours. But I loved my work, but it was very bad paid. Um, but 
when when we learned about the United Farm Workers, we didn't want to join the union because um, uh, grape workers were earning very little. It was by the hour, so it was less. We were earning more. But what really pushed us to get organized was the pesticides we were being sprayed when we were working. It's, it, my, I, I know my mother during her, in the 60s in Idaho, and then us in the 70s, had, we, we were sprayed. And I know my, my mother has a lot of health issues because of that. And um, because she worked plenty of years. And, it, and I think she lost some pregnancies. You would say, well, she already had 10 children. Yeah, but that, you know, her reproductive system was damaged. And, um, and other, other health issues. And, um, and we have several of our sisters who also have health, issue, health issues because of that. And that's not just it. Um, we also didn't have any, any, any um, sanitary Los baños, as we call them. So for men, it's much easier, but for women, you know what it has to happen. Then we would go and hide behind the trees, and then we would find out someone else was watching. It's like, give me a break. But sometimes it was not intentional. Um, but, you know, for us, that, and then we were not paid our wages, there was a lot of wage, and still, many of the things I'm talking about are still happening. This is why we're still organizing. And um, so we decided to join the union, and that's how I learned. Not because women were, were taking the leadership during those years. It was, um, my father was, was very adamant in terms of convincing the other senores about the importance of get, getting organized, but he didn't have that much school. Actually, he did. He had very little school because he also was a farm worker in, from Texas, and um, so he would always ask me to help him out in terms of writing information or talking f for him or with him uh, to 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 talk to the rest of the workers, and um, because he was a negotiator, he he was hired by the union because people had a lot of support. You know, it supported my dad because. Era de este hueso colorado, as we call them, no? Well, where I'm getting at here is that um, I tagged along my dad, and I see the majority were men. And it was that, that's not bad. They were all very respectful with me. But I didn't see other women, much less other uh, teenagers like me or young adults. But I learned to organize, and I learned that organizing with a familia is one of the best things you can do. So I learned with time that there's a lot of power if you are working as a collective. My mom showed us, the, the elders of, uh, in my family, my, 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 my siblings and I, to do everything together. Of course, when we would go to Mexico, she would say, no, mija. Mijos, ustedes vayan a correr allá afuera because, you know, it's not seen right that the boys are washing dishes or things like that. But when we were here in the United States, which we spend more time here, uh, it was very different. Um, I, I want to concentrate on, on several things, and, and um, maybe it's this. Because of all the things that were happening to us, migrating from one place to another. We would migrate from the Coachella Valley to the Palo Verde, which is in Blythe, who never knows that, those areas, to Borrego Springs, and then come back to in the Riverside area. Because it was all citrus, not just lemons. It was uh, grapefruit, um, oranges. We did all that work. And then we, when we would go to the Central Valley, it was the almendra, the almonds, and some of the, some of the grape work. When we would do that kind of work, um, we would see many, many, many other workers um, go through some hard times. We never had the issue of immigration because most of us were either born here or we had our permanent residency. But we saw many people and we ended up housing a lot of them. And 
Apenas cabíamos nosotros en they also, you know, we, my, my, my parents would also say, you know, we want to protect them, you know, in different ways they would do that. And um, so I, I, I ended up getting a lot of those principles. But what really caught me was organizing. When you organize, if you organize by yourself, you can make a difference. But when you organize with many, you change the world. And when you organize, then I learned that when you organize with mujeres, oh man, quítate porque hay boy, ¿verdad? <laughs> it, it, it's like that. So, so there's there's different things um, that happened in my life that that really resonates every time I'm, I'm I'm talking to with people, and this is that you all, you all, people that I'm talking with, you all have your own experience. You all have gone through so much obstacles, hardship, and things that it's a matter of how hard it hits you and, and, and how quick you, you, you get up from that. And it makes you stronger if you learn from that. So I I want to thank every single one of you for being here because there's, you have your own purposes in life. And if you're here, it's because you're interested in education, you're interested in health, you're interested in the well-being, you're in interested in the security of your community, and because you want others to also learn from that. So, gracias. Muchas gracias. Okay, todavía no termino. Okay, todavía no termino. Okay, so the what I'm what I'm what I love also to share is this. When I worked for California Rural Legal Assistance, it's a legal services agency for ten years. They hired me from the fields because we were organizing in the fields. Of course, that organizing. Whomever knows how to, how, you know, what organizing takes um, in a company, you might get fired, right? Well, I was fired several times. It was not an easy thing, especially when they say, burlan de ti, and they, they, you know, take it, you know, they belittle you. There are different things happen, no? Um, at the same time, as a teenager and a young adult, um, as an organizer um, and a worker, especially a worker, um, I was, I learned about my rights, but during that time, this is why I'm saying that the, the union and many other people were not, were not prepared. Um, I was being sexually harassed. I am lucky I was not raped. I was being sexually harassed by the crew leader who was very close friends with my dad. So you all can know it was very hard for me to say something. And when I did try to say something, my dad, pobrecito, he didn't know how to deal with it. So he started asking me, but in a form of questioning. You know what happens when you question people. You start feeling like you're at fault. And I remember only crying and crying and not wanting to say anymore. And when all this was happening, I didn't know other women were going through the same thing. So I silenced myself for the rest of the years that I worked in the fields. So what do you think happened? I was harassed in other places because I became very vulnerable, knowing that maybe I was not going to be believed or maybe I was, people were going to shame me or maybe people were going to, me iban a echar la culpa. You know, I was going to be at fault. All these myths that I didn't understand, I just knew that that's the way that were some of the traditions. And, um, and then the other is the taboo. You don't talk about sexuality. You don't talk about sex. You don't talk about anything related to that. So it kept me from sharing. So it kept me more inhibited. So it was... It was much easier for the abusers 
because there were different companies. It wasn't just in one company, different companies. What we have found out through our, all the research that we've done since 1988 through now, that nine out of 10 women in the fields have been sexually harassed at least once in their lifetime at work. Count nine out of 10 women. 99 out of 100 women. So what does that mean? Or 90, actually. Yo no sé calcular, ¿verdad? Pero, eh, <laughs> but it's too many. How many of you have seen uh, the film Rape in the Fields? Raise your hand. You need to see that. You need to see it. Our organization helped this um, researcher done by PBS, they were presented in PBS and all the rest no? Um, they help bring out to light this kind of issue. This is just one out of, out of many other issues that women go through, the discrimination. When I was pregnant, I was fired. Well, I'm lucky I was just pregnant once, you know? So I was fired. I was fired, and, and uh, I had to do something else because we needed to support, you know, the family. But then, in a certain point in time, I started to understand que mejor that I didn't have to do that kind of work, verdad? Because of the chemicals. Well, anyway, where I'm getting at right now is um, when, with time, because I was hired, because I was a, an organizer, and uh, there were many different, there's many different stories that, we, that I, along other women and men at the beginning, went through about abuse, exploitation, um, minimization about who we are. All that went by. When I started understanding that it wasn't just happening to me, Oh, that angered me very much because I really, se me prendió el foco. I really started understanding, sabes que, Emily, if you keep shut, what's going to happen? The continuum of abuse, the cycle of abuse keeps happening. If uh, the abuser is abusing one person, you will always find out they're abusing many other women. We have helped many women that have not just been assaulted like me. They've been raped in the fields. Not so far from here, Rivera, Rivera Company. Too bad it's a Latino company. It was a Latino company. Several women complained. And when after they complained, there was a lawsuit and the discovery in all that is that not only the mayordomos, not only the supervisors, not only the general supervisors, the owner and some workers were raping women in the fields. That is very sad. It's a culture that has been created as easy as that. That's not fair. That's not fair. So when we started talking, it was very, very hard for us. We could talk among ourselves, but we were not willing to talk somewhere else. So let me real quick say this. I was working, yes, for that legal services agency. I felt that I, I already knew what to give people because I'm from that community. I was giving information. I was telling people, this is what you can do. This is, these are all your rights. And then I, was, I started questioning, why don't do people do anything? ¿Por qué no hacen nada? ¿Por qué no se defienden? Porque, you know, I started questioning. And then it was a slap in my face when I learned, Mili, you're not the savior. Give the information and people will decide when. And you know how, how that came about? It's when we did this needs assessment, this needs assessment about, and, and um, because your students are here and faculty, look this up. It's the Pharmacal Women's Needs Assessment by Maria Elena Lopez Trevino. And she did this 
um, master's thesis with pharma, about pharmacal women. And some of us helped in terms of putting together the, the questionnaire. I'm going to say it real quick because ya se me está acabando el tiempo and I wanted to say many other things. Okay. Um, uh, it was about um, finding out all the issues that pharmacal women were going through, their families, education, um, it, their immigration, not necessarily about immigration status, about immigrating to the United States. Um, uh, in terms of violence against women, we didn't use those terms because we knew it was going to be kind of hard. Um, and um, actually, that uh, thesis got an award at Cal State Long Beach because she was doing her, her, her thesis over there. And without having, I didn't, I didn't go to high school, okay, to start with. And um, I was already helping with that. Um, I learned about not having limits after, after organizing and um, doing many other things. So when, when we did this, um, this uh, assessment, what helped me really understand that wanting to do something in the community is not just taking something to people and saying, here it is, I have the information for you, I know what you need. Al contrario. Get them involved. Get them engaged. Get them to learn more. Help them understand that they have the power of deciding what is going to happen with their life. That changed my life. The women were not saying that when we were interviewing them. They were saying all the issues, all the problems. But then there was a question towards the end, or several questions towards the end that were helping us understand what is it that they think needs to be done to, to do change in all these issues that they were sharing. Some of them se estaban quejando de all the service providers, okay? That the bad, whatever, different things, right? Well, what helped me really understand that the work I was doing is just service. It wasn't changing. It was giving information to people, yes. But getting them involved to see themselves as, ¿sabes qué? Yo no voy a esperar que, me, que venga alguien a salvarme. I'm not going to wait for anybody to come and save me. So the women started saying, if there are any groups for women, or is there any support for us? So the, but, uh, I mean, in their own words, they were saying all this. So the women that were uh, interviewing, the interviewers, we would get together. As an organizer, I would get them together. Les, vamos a hablar. Y, 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 you know what I'm learning from them is that they're not, at, they're not expecting us to go and save them. They're not expecting us to just give them what services exist. They want a space so that they can also learn and do something for themselves, for their families, for their community, and the ripple effect goes on and on. It was very hard for me to take that. This is why I'm saying it was a slap in my face because I learned I am not the savior. And then from there on, we started inviting women in the different areas, and I can only tell you that some of the women that work with us that are still in the movement were the women that helped us start organizing with Mujeres Mexicanas, and then Lideres Campesinas, and then we now have a national organization of pharmacal women. And nadie nos ha parado y no nos van a parar. This, it's about, yes, determination. It's about, you know, and, and I see Dr. Enrique very close to me, that means that I need to stop that. So, um, so does this make sense with everybody? Yes? Is it just because I'm up here that you're saying yes? I mean, tell me the truth. <laughs> so, if anything, what we have learned is I was making a lot of difference on my own. But organizing with more people and learning that everybody has something to offer or many things to offer makes a lot of difference. So I 
completely believe in the power of the collective. For me, that's it. So in California, we organize 11 chapters of Pharmaco Women, chingonas. I'm serious, chingonas. And what, what is it that we, we don't only do information to distribute. We go to the, to the councils, we go to the commissions, and some of them are wanting to become commissioners, and some of them are want to be part of the city councils, and we're going as far as that. It's not, nothing stopping us. It's not about convincing only the public officials. It's becoming one. Right? And learning from that. So this is this and many other things we have learned. Of course, we have gone to China. We have gone to South Africa. We, we have gone to Europe. We have gone to Latin America, to many places where the women are talking our issues but are saying, this is what we're doing to create change because it's us that are going to be able, as we learn and we work together, is we're going to make the changes in our communities. And the last thing is, who has heard about Time's Up and what's going on in the entertainment industry with sexual harassment in the workplace, the actresses? Raise your hand. Yo sé que todos saben. Okay. Our organization, Alianza Nacional de Campesinas, with Líderes Campesinas, which is the organization here, helped put together that open letter for the, the women and men in the entertainment industry, saying, we understand what you're going through. We are not surprised, but we're with you, and we believe you. And we will stand right next to you because the only way this culture of violence against women is going to change is that all of us join and work together. So, hacemos el aplauso. time for one question from the audience if everybody wants to go ahead and stand in front of the mic hello good afternoon can everybody hear me yeah, yeah? okay good um, so first of all muchas gracias for every for everything that you've done all your work that you've done in the past years um, my name is Montserrat Torres Garcia I'm from the Puente project and I represent Riverside City College um, so my question for you is as someone who has um, done so much work in various circles, what advice do you have about taking care of yourself and celebrating the success of these groups? Wow. <laughs> my familia. My familia. The, the same way uh, we work together in, you know, supporting the community, the same way we celebrate and we support each other. I know Veronica, my sister here, she's younger than me, but she acts like she's older than me. <laughs> because she's always taking care of me, I take care of her and she takes care of me. And, but we're 10. Well, two years ago, we lost one of, but we, we are together. We're together. What was the part of the second question? The, the, the question? So, um, how do you celebrate the success of these groups that you're involved in? You know, the women, we're learning to celebrate it. And let me tell you why. It's, it's very something very, and it, it might resonate with everybody. We're so used to doing a project and finish that or campaign and finish it and then ahí viene el otro, otra campaña. something else is happening and we have to you're we're running all the time verdad 
and uh, we're so used to just saying, oh yeah, victory, and then let's have some beer if, if you have if you drink, um, <laughs> or let's let's get together and let's have a cena, and, and that's it. No, we we talk about what were the successes there, what were the things that we can do not only better. We're not debriefing only. Y estamos comiendo, and the more, the more that we know that we need to do better, we're eating more, no? Y ya después, este, cuando, cuando, when, when we feel that we're, we're doing the success, we're saying, we're drinking, no, no, este, <laughs> so, but success, we, we celebrate different ways, and the women, what they like doing is getting together and honoring each other. Now, every, every year, they do a celebration in their community, and they honor each other. And that's very important, because when they honor each other, they start talking about all the different things that are happening there, and then, and then we care for each other. Something happens with one of us, ahí anda toda la bolita atrás, you know? We're all helping each other. Because if we don't do that, then what's the purpose of, of having a collective? It's not just about, oh, ¿qué estamos haciendo allá para cambiar el mundo? You know, ¿qué dice el dicho ese? Uh, Candil de la calle, oscuridad de tu casa. We, we change that. We change that. And one of the best things I, I do want to say, and it's not part of your question, but this, this is something. How do we know we're good organizers? Because we organize with our familia. And if you organize with a familia, the familia will help. And it's a ripple effect. When you don't organize the familia, the familia will not understand what you're doing. Ah, they're going to put pressure on you. Hey, ya andas allá, que quien sabe qué. But when they're, when they're organized, they're, they're there to support. And then in the culture, we know that our men are the head of the household. Pero guess what? <laughs> we know that as women, we're the center of the family. So, as Dr. Enrique was talking yesterday, if the woman is very, if women are very well informed and know how to get information, know how to support each other, then the world will change. If women are given that space or we give each other that space, we will change many cultures that are creating so, so much harm to our communities. So, muchísimas gracias, muchísimas gracias, muchísimas gracias. Thank you. Gracias, que vive la mujer. Se puede? Muy bien. Muy bien. If we can stand up, we want to uh, honor Millie. Oh. Elmira Treviño Sauceda, with much gratitude for your accomplishments and service to our community, we are awarding you our Lead Education and Advocacy Medallion of Honor. so many obstacles, sabes que eso no es nada. It's hard, it's hard, but always look forward, be open, there's the light at the end of the tunnel, and there's gonna, you're gonna find many more lights. You are very smart, think of yourself as being very smart, because you are, and you have a lot of potential. Use it, gracias. Thank you once again, Millie. 
Okay, folks, we're going to switch quickly, so just give us a couple of minutes. Don't go too far. That's right. We are here live at Cal State University San Bernardino, and I want to take a moment, based on that last uh, discussion, for all those that are still in the room, how many here, by a show of hands, uh, have a cell phone? If I could just yes. have each of you just raise your hands, I'll, then I'll know you're paying attention. Yay. And those that aren't paying attention, then I'll really know you're not paying attention. <laughs> uh, so raise your hand if you have a cell phone. We see you. Five people out of a thousand? <laughs> uh, oh, there we go. Okay. Now, how many of you have Facebook? Uh, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Now, this is what we do with the collective voice. We've been uh, sharing, or at least I've been sharing to my wall, uh, uh, that we're here at the Latino Education Advocacy Day. How many of you would like to share that on your Facebook profiles as well? Can I get a... Yes. I mean, this is all part of what Millie was saying about organizing with the familia. So yes. your Facebook familia should hear about what you're doing today. Exactly. So if we can have you go to the Latino Education Advocacy Day fan page, you'll see the live stream there, share it with to your wall, and let people know that you're here. That's the lead Latino Education and Advocacy Day. And speaking of the collective voice, uh, let's bring on Mili. Hello, Mili. Now, we Hola. both heard you speaking just a moment ago, and I think, Jeanette, you had a question. Yes, I, you were talking about organizing. And when we talk about the socially, uh, the, the social, um, what was it, the, the word you used, uh, disadvantaged person. It's one thing to organize when people feel that they have a voice, but what would you say to the person who wants to do some type of organizing in inner cities that with the people who maybe don't feel that their voice should be heard or they have a right to be here, especially in the political climate we're in? Hey, no se dejen para empezar, no? Um, there's, there's a lot more that you have within that you can, you can offer. And there's opportunities, there's groups that you can join and maybe learn from that because that's how we started. Organizing, uh, getting together, and then learning from each other because as we learn from each other, we, we start thinking, wow, all these different things I can do? I didn't know. And then when you start doing them, you're unstoppable. Yes, absolutely. Well, speaking Great of advice. unstoppable, doing all the work that you're doing over there, uh, you spoke of sexual violence and, and unfortunately the numbers of what is happening. What, what needs to be done by those in the community and those that are watching right now? What, how can they help? Uh, support causes in different ways. I mean, join the causes that exist, the groups that are there. Um, if you hear about something and you hear if someone is not supportive, talk to them if you really understand the issue. And don't, don't be a standby person only, uh, because as we say in Spanish, el que calla otorga. And if, if, you, if you are involved, that means that you have a purpose. Bring your purposes up. And then with that, you're going you're gonna to find out that many other people in your community also want to do something, but they, they want to make sure that there will be others to support. Good. Well said, well said. Yes, thank you. And we're actually asking everyone here to be a part of this by sharing what we're doing today on their Facebook with their Facebook familia. But I think uh, they'll listen to you more than they will me. <laughs> so can you tell everybody, bring out their cell phone, go on Facebook and share the video of what we just said? I see. Um, English, Spanish, whatever. Um, yeah, see, both. Okay, all right. Hey, pónganse en, en live stream. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Facebook, Facebook, Facebook link. Facebook. 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 Uh, the página de Facebook, the Lead Latino Education and Advocacy. Um, uh, because if you do that, you're going to see all the great things that we're talking about. And that no, not only that you're learning, you're going to find out how many people are, are involved and you can also join. So get on Facebook right now. Yeah, If she doesn't go. get you to do see? it, I mean, I don't know who will. I'm telling you. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you very much. Aww for spending time with Thank us. You so Thank you. Much. Give her another round of applause. Great speaker. We really enjoyed Thank that. Thank you so Thank very you. much. Again, I think we're ready. All right, let's continue with Latino right. Education Advocacy Days 2018 with que the next segment. Mujer. Yes. Thank you. Thank you once again. Muy bien. Okay, now it's my great pleasure to turn it over to Diana. Diana Z. Rodriguez is the president. La Mera Mera, where she's at. The president of San Bernardino Valley College. 
Diana previously served as the Vice President of Student Services at Las Positas College in the Shaba Las Positas Community College District. She has nearly, how many years? Let's not say, but a lot of years <laughs> of higher education experience. Prior to joining the, the Las Positas team, she was VP of Student Services at Palo Verde College. Oh, that was mentioned a little while ago, right? Over there by Blythe. In La Cuna, La Cuna de Aslan, right? She has served as a tenured faculty member at San Bernardino Valley College within the counseling department and taught courses in student development and human development. While at Palo Verde College, she taught courses in organizational leadership and marketing. Uh, Ms. Rodriguez has earned an associate's degree from Palo Verde College in liberal arts, a bachelor's degree in marketing, a master's degree in business administration, and also a master's degree here in education from CSU San Bernardino. Okay, all yours, Presidenta. Thank you, Dr. Murillo, I appreciate that warm introduction. Before we begin, I'd like to start out by just kind of um, reviewing the session today for all of the folks who may not have a pamphlet or a booklet. So I'll read, I'll read quickly the description for our panel. It's entitled, Latina College Administrators, Triumphs and Challenges While Leaving a Legacy. In the United States, not only the overall growth within the Latino population, but especially increased student attendance and presence on campuses of higher education has led to an increased prevalence of social inequalities for our students. There is very few Lat Latino representation overall within the leadership positions at, at our colleges and universities, and more so the representation of Latinas, women executives, either at community colleges or four-year institutions is dismal. Of those Latina executives, most serve at the community colleges versus the four-year universities. Those Latinas, however, who have served in executive positions have attained a wealth of knowledge through their experiences in leading complex institutions. It is extremely important that we learn how Latinas describe their experiences and challenges while providing hope to the students they serve and within their communities. So with that, I would like to introduce the talented Latina leadership that we have within some of our four-year schools and our community colleges. As Dr. Morillo said, my name is Diana Rodriguez, and I am the 14th president of San Bernardino Valley College. I am the first Latina president in the college's 91-year history. And with that, I am extremely grateful to our Board of Trustees and our Chancellor, Mr. Bruce Barron, for providing me the opportunity to lead one of the most historic colleges in our state, which happens to be in my community. Thank you. On the program, um, Dr. Rita Zapeta was um, scheduled to be here. Dr. Zapeta was the Chancellor uh, retired chancellor from the San Jose Evergreen Community College and with a long, rich, rich history of advocacy for Latinos. But unfortunately, due to some unexpected circumstances, she wasn't able to, to join us, but we appreciate her contributions to our presentation. With us, we also have Olivia Rosas. Olivia is the first Latina Associate Vice President in Cal State San Bernardino's 50-year history. <laughs> Just a couple of things about Olivia. She has worked in education for over 30 years and was appointed as the Associate Vice President for Student Success and Educational Equity in 2010. Under her leadership, Cal State witnessed record enrollments substantial increases in financial aid and scholarship awards, and the establishment of the Office of Pre-Collegiate Programs and Undocumented Student Success Center, just to name a few of her successes. 
Over the years, she's been honored with many, many, many awards, including Employee of the Year for here at Cal State San Bernardino, the Pique Appreciation Award, the Pioneer Alley Award for her work with the African American community, and most recently, the Lead Summit Medallion for her services. Thank you, Olivia, for being here. Next, we have Noemi Noravas. Noemi was the first Latina Associate Superintendent Vice President of Student Services at Allen Hancock College, and the institution has been with us for 98 years. She was appointed as Allen Hancock College's Associate Superintendent Vice President for Student Services in 2014. Her leadership roles have included Dean of Student Services and a Director of Financial Aid. In 2016, she was one of only seven people selected to receive the Honored Alumni Award, the highest honor award by the Alumni Association of Cal Poly St. Louis Obispo. She also received a Latino Legacy Award for making a difference in the Santa Maria community and was named Pacific Coast Business Times 40 Under 40 Class of 2016, recognized in part of a few, excuse me, recognized part of a new generation of dynamic leaders throughout the St. Louis Obispo, Santa Barbara, and Ventura counties. Thank you, Nomi, for being here. Also, we have Dr. Cynthia Olivo. <laughs> Cynthia's got some fans in the room. <laughs> Cynthia was the first Latina vice president at Pasadena City College, an institution with 92 years of history. What an accomplishment. <laughs> Dr. Olivo has been a professional in higher education since 1995. For 23 years, she has served in the capacities, uh, leadership capacities, including a dean, associate vice president, and vice president. This is her 16th year as a administrator, including seven, seven years at the university level and nine years with her community colleges. Her leadership qualities include the ability to lead innovation and improve student success consensus building among stakeholder groups to ad advance student success, while creating an engaging, inclusive environment to foster change in our practices with an emphasis on implementing cultural competence. Her initiatives include collaborating to create at scaled up uh, pathway programs, Pasadena's Complete gradua Graduation Initiative, Student Equity Leadership to Transform Colleges and College Practices in the Classroom, Hiring, and Within Student Services Programs. All of these efforts and many, many more have resulted in, a in contributing toward Pasadena earning the distinction of one of the top 10 community colleges in the nation by the Aspen Prize for Community College Excellence. Thank you. Yeah. In order to frame our discussion, I, I realized that that was a rather lengthy um, introduction to our presentation. However, I wanted to highlight the accomplishments and the successes of Latinas in our community because I think that is something that we don't hear enough about. As one of our Puente students says, how do you celebrate those successes? One of those ways in which to celebrate the success is, is to speak it and not let it just rest on a plaque somewhere or in our, in our history books and so on, but to speak it so that others hear it and acknowledge our accomplishments and celebrate it. So with that, we have some, we've designed some um, questions that, um, that all of us will respond to to kind of talk about what we have experienced what we, what we believe are our responsibilities and what we hope to leave as a legacy as we move through our careers. So our first question that we'll address is, what do you believe are the current challenges and the biggest challenges for the next generation of Latina leaders? You know, if, um, if Rita were here, Dr. Zapeda, she would probably say crisis leadership, right? 
and by that, that goes beyond managing the communication or, or highlighting a notion that the best, you know, highlighting the notion on how to deal with crisis, but it's really about building a foundation of trust. It's about organizing and meeting with your communities and the folks that you work with and to build that strong foundation that is going to help organizations get through difficult times and leveraging these crisis situations, right? And what it means and what we can do to change institutions for the better. And at the core of this crisis, leadership, I would say, would be communication with all of the stakeholders and all of your constituent groups, including students, one of our most precious constituent groups. Clarity of your vision and values of the institution and caring relationships. Now, I thought about if I should include that or not, right? Because you don't hear most men talk about caring relationships, right? But us women, us Latinos, know how valuable those relationships can be. And those who pay attention to those relationships, whether it be under crisis or in our everyday work and in our everyday challenges, um, it, it's difficult to do that because there's a lot of noise coming at us, a lot of things as leaders that we have to, to respond to on a daily basis. But if we can do that, if we can get past the noise, then it makes it that much easier to move beyond and break free of the norms of our history and allow us to solve the problems that were created in our past, crisis leadership. So Naomi, would you like to respond as well? First of all, I'd like to thank everyone for being here. This is such a great honor to be up here, and I'm surrounded by wonderful leaders and very inspired after today. I think one of our responsibilities is to ensure that everyone has access to create an environment where we are able to reach our educational goals. And there's a couple of things that can be done through that. The first one is looking at institutional policies and identifying the barriers. Oftentimes we talk about the policies um, that have been in place in existence for a very long time and they're very difficult to change. And I think that's why I'm up here today as an advocate and as a leader is because I saw the inequities in the policies and it's really our role to be an advocate to create those changes so that we can foster a positive learning environment for everyone. The second thing that I think is really important is to create opportunities for students. We have to be able to create the opportunities for children and students to grow in themselves. If we do not create that, it's difficult for us to have the leadership and the advocacy that we need. And oftentimes we, we do a lot at the high schools and, and I wanna advocate that we do more at the elementary schools. I really think that we need to begin younger. It's, it's, not, um, it's not effective just working with the high schools. We need to inspire students at a younger age. And that's the third, the third thing that goes into building confidence. Oftentimes I see a lot of students and we do not have the confidence to make the change or to, to make decisions to move on and advocate. By starting at an earlier age, we can begin to instill that confidence in every child and every student that there is open doors to education and that education does change opportunities. Thank you. Cynthia? Yes, uh, I believe that um, one of the most important issues that we as leaders can undertake is to keep our eye on uh, student success uh, completion rates, uh, especially for our students who are coming from historically marginalized communities. And if somebody is keeping their eye on that data, then um, that person is also helping us as practitioners to change what we do. I believe that um, you know our students are college ready. We do not need to create a college going culture. They're ready for college. And as a Latina leader, what I help do is to 
um, do what a, a new book that's just out on the market a couple of years, it says to help us become student ready colleges, right? And that requires all of us to reflect upon our practices and to increase the sense of belonging that students feel on college campuses. And so I believe that as a Latina leader, it's my uh, opportunity to create consensus amongst us as practitioners about agreeing that we are going to take the responsibility to change our practices so that we meet students where they are and we help them succeed. And at Cal, uh, I'm, I'm an alumni of Cal State San Bernardino, so I think I slipped back into my role with used to work here and present on this stage. But at Pasadena City College, what we've been working on over the past few years has increased our Latino student success, um, you know, from 36.8% completion rate to 43.7% completion rate for Latino students specifically. And out of 30,000 students, 51% of our students are Latino. So as a Latina leader, it, it, I do take it as my responsibility to ensure that we are not just a Hispanic-serving institution by number, but we're a Hispanic-serving institution in action. And, and so that's what I believe are, um, you know, the things that we should be focusing upon. Olivia, would you like to respond? Just a couple of things. Um, I think just to echo what both Noemi and, and Cynthia have said is, is that, you know, being a leader is tough. But um, along with the risks that we take, uh, we really need to see, see that through a, a, a lens of also an opportunity. Because nothing that is worth fighting for, you've heard this, is, is going to be easy. So, but the foundation for that, at least for me, is that you have to build relationships. Because the more buy-in you get and the more that you get support to change policy and to, to change the systemic ways that sometimes we operate under, you're going to, you, you can't be alone. You cannot do it by yourself. So building relationships and building alliances is what's going to, to make us, you know, make progress, to help us to make progress. Um, along the lines what Cynthia mentioned in terms of, you know, uh, our students, absolutely, our students are ready. They want to go to college. They want um, uh, the opportunity to, to succeed. They, and, and we, our job, our responsibility is to have that, uh, that give them access, but not only provide them with access so they can get here, it's, it's what are the institutions doing internally in the classroom through extracurricular you know, uh, type of activities. What are we doing as institutions to be ready for the students that we are bringing into our different you know, uh, campuses? So it's, it's learning to navigate and to advocate uh, for our students, but also gaining the support from other key players you know, at our campuses to be able to succeed. Thank you. You know, our last speaker talked about sexual harassment in the workplace, in the fields, and so on. Um, what, what can we do to eliminate sexual harassment and gender disparities in leadership roles? You know, we've all heard the adage, see something, say something, right? But a lot of times we stay, take a step back because we're intimidated or we fear how that might reflect on us, or will we be causing more problems for the person that we see as the victim? You know, what is, what is our role in that? And in terms of leadership roles, we need more Latinas within the education administration. I am currently one of six, maybe five, I understand one just retired. One of five or six Latina presidents in the California Community College System, a system with 114 colleges in 76 districts. Very, very low percentage for Latinas in leadership. You know, I would say that we need to encourage, as Olivia stated, to take risk. Oftentimes, Latinas are risk adverse. We're not raised to take risk. I would challenge everyone in this room to step out. Step out and step up. 
and take on a roll, stretch a little bit, and then stretch a little more to take on some leadership roles and also be a mentor. I know I'm still in contact, very much in contact with, with one of my mentors as I moved into administration, uh, Ms. Judith Baez. And while I was here, um, I was also an alum and worked here at Cal State San Bernardino. Um, I was taken under the wing of, of the late Dr. Rosa Gonzalez, who, was, who I was considered one of my mentors as well. So I would also challenge you to be a mentor to someone who you see who has potential or maybe just needs the encouragement. So ladies, in, in your opinions, what can we do to eliminate sexual harassment and gender disparities in leadership roles? Cynthia? Thank you, Diana. I, I believe it's really important for us to create a climate where people feel safe to come forward and to share their experiences regarding sexual harassment. So uh, in, that, in saying that, I, I believe it's best to create networks on your campus so that people can share with you informally about what they're experiencing and then familiarize yourself with the policies and procedures of formal reporting of sexual harassment. Now in my 20s, I am somebody who did experience sexual harassment and I reported it to the Fair Employment Equal Housing Officer in San Bernardino. And the process was very clear and within three months my case was resolved. And so I can share with you that although it may be unfamiliar territory to speak up and to report this formally, it does help. In my situation, I asked for all of the employees of this particular business here in town to mandate sexual harassment training for everyone who worked there. I also asked that all pictures that displayed women in scantily clad clothing to be removed. And um, you know, I also, I think, requested for um, compensation during the time that I wasn't able to work while the investigation was occurring. And so I share that to encourage those of you, if you ever experience it, do not be afraid to report. It can be resolved. Um, both formally and informally. And so create that network, uh, then you can gain strength from one another and report. Thank you. Thank you. Olivia? Yeah. You know, I know um, that, that we're, we're afraid sometimes, like, like Cynthia mentioned uh, and, and Diana, to, to say something. But as you can see, Cynthia says something. She's vice president of students. <laughs> <laughs> You know, at, at um, Pasadena City College, and that's because we we have to have that courage, you know. But, but again, we can't do that in isolation. I think um, seeking support is is first and foremost, and feel you know comf comfortable going to someone and, and, and sharing you know your your situation. Uh, and second, um, speak out. I think once. You know, you're, you're able to, to get through the, the, the trauma and, and um, feel comfortable with whoever you have divulged or confided in, in the situation. The people would help you. There, there is, there is um, assistance, and, and I think um, we just need to be there for each other, uh, for other uh, women, you know, who, who experience uh, that kind of uh, situations. Thank you. Naomi. Well, I, I think uh, sexual harassment is everywhere, and um, victims can be uh, as young as a newborn to uh, an adult. And so I think that the, the best way to address um, these issues are talking about them. So through education and being open to have conversations. Oftentimes, we steer away from the difficult conversations um, because we don't want to talk about them. But having open conversations um, and being open to share freely in a safe space is really, really important. Uh, colleges have uh, strengthened their initiatives to create awareness 
and um, create support for students. So I think stronger mental health services and collaborations with our communities, our community agencies, um, are, is, is very, very important and instrumental to ensure that um, students or victims are getting the support that they need. Switching topics a bit, I want to talk a, a bit about our responsibility in regards to the DACA legislation. So what do we see as most important for our students and our communities? I know that at San Bernardino Valley College, the most important thing that we do is to let students know that we stand with them and that we support them. San Bernardino um, was at our campus, had the very first Dreamer Center in the state. And one of the things that we pride ourselves on is that we have a great number of individuals from our community, really resources from our communities, from activists to attorneys that come in and talk with our students and their families about their rights and what they can do to protect themselves. You know, our students are scared, and rightfully so. And I think it is our responsibility to show that we do care, not only just in words, but in our actions. And one of the things that I'm very proud of that our Board of Trustees and our Chancellor did almost right away, sent out a letter, of really a diversity statement, that talks about how we honor at both of our institutions, San Bernardino Valley College and Crafton Hills College, about how we honor diversity and that we will work with all of our students to ensure their safety as well as their family's safety, because it is important. Cynthia, would you like to respond first? Yes. So it was here at Cal State San Bernardino when I was an undergraduate that I organized a group called the Chicano Coalition. And it was one of, one of the first issues that we um, were able to address. And that was when we did not have Assembly Bill 540. We did not have DACA. And so I believe organizing groups on your campuses for students to join is extremely important. That way our students feel peer-to-peer -peer support and then working in collaboration with the administration. And that's where it's key that Latinos and Latinas are represented in the administration because oftentimes our students do not feel safe coming forward to share their status. However, if they can identify somebody that they connect with, then they're more inclined to share and we can offer the help and support. At Pasadena City College, uh, for the past five years now, we've um, held a program that we designed called um, the Safe Zone Coalition. And we've provided uh, professional development for over 500 faculty, staff, and administrators who are now allies for undocumented students. And I'm very proud to also share that this summer we will open our Safe Zone Center. And so it's a, a very strong movement on our campus and we do have around 1,000 undocumented students. And in order to help our students feel safer, um, if they do not feel comfortable during this um, national political climate, we also have a very vibrant and active social media campaign so that our students have all of the information about free resources available in the San Gabriel and Los Angeles Valley. Um, it's really helpful to do that. I monitor how many views we have whenever we post a flyer or information about free DACA renewal workshops, et cetera. And then we also host that on our campus. So I think it's extremely important that we make sure our institutions are providing the opportunities to s show our students, our undocumented students specifically, that we support them. To all of our dreamers out there, I'd like to say that, you know, years and years and years ago, I remember uh, when I was a recruiter for Cal State San Bernardino, a student told me, you know, I want to go to college like you're saying that I should, pero me estás abriendo una puerta a una puerta cerrada. 
And I remember that student, I said, you know, we'll do our part, we're gonna fight so that we change the laws. You do your part, go to college and we'll, we'll take care of the rest. And, and I'm so proud that since that time we have Assembly Bill 540, we have a number of laws in place so that we are helping our undocumented students now at the state and federal level. And that's something that I always remind everyone about who is employed at a college or a university. You might have your own personal opinion about these topics, but as educators, we must all follow the law. And uh, it's good to remind people about that. In the interest of time, I'm gonna move on to our next question. Enrique is giving me the look back here. Yeah. So, but um, I did want to, to ask each of the panelists, and I'll divulge myself, what would we like our legacy to be? Because I think that's important on how we operate and how we go about our careers. I know that I would like my legacy to be that she educated the Inland Empire. She made a difference in our community. Because I think our work starts here for me. It starts in, in our own communities and there's so much work to be done. In maybe one or two sentences, Olivia, what would you say your legacy? To be? I'm gonna take 30 seconds to address the question before this. Because I would be remiss if I didn't. She's give. a leader, she, but she can't follow directions. <laughs> if I, <laughs> strong leadership if if i did i would be remiss if i didn't recognize the efforts of the staff here at cal state university san Bernardino who really uh, worked very hard to establish the undocumented student center on our campus we serve over 800 students and it took exactly what cynthia said talking with people um, letting students know that we were here to support them. The administration su has supported, and our staff and students have supported every initiative, all the efforts. Our faculty senate signed a resolution. President's office gave us money to open the center, to have operating expenses for the center, to secure a position, and we are just doing great things. So, so I really had to, had to share that. Um, And, and I think to, to now address uh, the question I was supposed to address, um, it's, I, I think for me, um, I would like to be remembered or leave uh, a legacy that, that I put people first. Uh, because I know people put me first before I got to where I'm at. Uh, that I opened doors and I advocated for students. Um, also that I was tough but fair but most importantly, I think also that uh, I earned people's respect through my actions and that I was a trustworthy individual. I can Santa. vouch for the fact that Olivia was tough but fair. She was my first boss when I was an administrator. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, Amy? A lot of community colleges have uh, developed promise programs, which are um, a way for students to get their first year free at a community college. And I think in terms of legacy, we talk about creating a college going culture or already having a college going culture. I think for me, I'd really like students to stay in college and be able to complete uh, their educational goal. Oftentimes, we see students and financial aid and finances are a huge barrier to our students being able to continue on. And as a financial aid advocate, uh, I hope to really create um, policies and procedures and practices that will improve our, our outcomes for students. And uh, my legacy, I would like for it to include the fact that uh, I put students at the center of our work and I create a sense of familia amongst all of us educators and community members while creating the conditions for change so that we can improve our services, our programs, and our learning experiences for our students so that they can achieve their dreams. My legacy. My legacy, as I, as I stated before, is that I, 
I truly would like to be known for having helped to educate the Inland Empire, and I'm passionate about that. Um, I say it at all of our opening days at our campus, and I am so committed to it that I get criticized for this, but it's about building relationships and being a mentor and doing all those things that for every student that I speak with and for every student group that I meet every semester that comes onto our campus in any setting, I provide them my personal cell phone number. Because I don't want any student, regardless of age, to feel that they don't have someone that they can't connect with, to speak with, about going to school. So no excuses with me, call me. All right, let's give it up. Okay, we could do we could do one question. If you if you promise, it'll be like super quick. You have a is Puentistas have a question? <laughs> Hello, my name is Luis Velasco Miranda. I am a student from the Riverside Community College District. Um, and a product of the Puente project. Um, long story short, Puente works. Yes. It's been proven. Yes. Um, without Puente, uh, I believe that myself and many more would have trickled out of our college education. Um, my question to you is, how can you, as Latinas in leadership, specifically college administrators, um, join us to find this consistent support that Puente has been fighting for for the past 35 plus years. And how can you help to have Puente institutionalized and support its growth? And not just Puente, but many other programs as well. Do any of you? One of the things that I, would, that I would suggest to recommend is that if you're looking for support, not only at the, well, what I would re recommend is to look for support, not only on your college campuses, right, but also within your community. When your Latina president asks you to join her at, in Sacramento to talk about student issues, please join me when you come. If you're not invited to, to participate, invite yourself. Step up. Step up. I know that I would appreciate it. I think I can speak for my colleagues when they say that. And Cynthia reminded me that I didn't give you my cell phone number. <laughs> true, true to my word. 909-800-6252. Larissa has it on the speed dial. She'll get it to you. 909-800-6252. No excuses for not going to school. Thank you. Yeah. A question from social media? Yes. The question comes from Marcela Ramirez, who's at Cal State University, Long Beach. Ask, in the spirit of Gloria Anzaldúa, what is your responsibility in combating cis-heteronormativity, cis-sexism, homophobia, and transphobia within the Chicanx, Latinx community and our movements in admissions, policies, procedures, and student services? What are you doing to combat master narratives about the Chicanx, Latinx community that do not include the stories of queer and trans Chicanx, Latinx leaders? Cynthia? Yes, so I can answer that. You know, our Safe Zone Coalition that I mentioned at Pasadena City College, it's twofold. Um, we help students come out of the shadows, and that's two populations. Undocumented students is one, and our LGBTQ students is the other. And so our allies go through an eight-hour training. The first four hours is about undocumented students, and the next four hours are about our LGBTQ students. 
and our safe zone center will be for both populations. And I do believe it's extremely important as leaders that we ensure we're creating inclusive environments for all. And a sense of belonging is extremely important. And so every cue possible that we can send to our students to tell them that we care about them and we want them to succeed is extremely important. So I, I wanted to share, those are a couple of things that we've done at Pasadena City College. Que viva la mujer! Que viva! Que viva. With much gratitude. Um, I want to point out that none of our speakers charge us. Nobody says, hey, it's going to cost you, Enrique, uh, you know, <laughs> money. No, we do this for the cause, right? So this is, this is our contribution to the cause. Okay, so this is what's going to happen, all right? We don't want you to go away too far, but we need to take about a seven-minute break. Okay, this is what's going to happen. Okay, promise me you're going to come back in seven minutes. I'm afraid, <laughs> right? Because we only have one session left. It's our capstone. It's the last thing. And it's with the madrinas. It's the heavy hitters. The madrinas. They're going to they're gonna talk about what the last 60 years has looked like. The last 70 years has looked like. Okay? So we're going to roll in a cake here. The madrinas are going to take some pictures. Then we're going to roll the cake back. Please get your slice of cake. We have leftover burritos. They're going to go bad. And our students are not here this week. Right? So... Take a burrito to go. There's fruit cups, okay? Please go listen to Evangelina y su, su, su trompete de oro and be back here in seven minutes, okay? Sale? Sale y vale. Thank you. Thank you. No de nada? Well, it's the last hour or so the that we're, yeah, the final stretch here at LEAD 2018. I can't believe it because. Uh, we've started and prepared so much for this, and now it's winding down. But what pretty powerful and impactful stories we've heard today, right? Yes, absolutely. I, I, uh, I don't know about you, Aaron, but I don't even need espresso on a day like this. <laughs> There's so many yeah. people that are speaking today. And they today. do have espresso, by the <laughs> way, out there. So. But it's just it's, it's very empowering to hear the stories of yes. the speakers we've had today. Uh, before we forget, we should mention a few sponsors. Yes, let's, uh, because without their help, we, the, all of this would be very difficult to do. I believe it still would be done in some way, shape, or form, but with their help, it makes it so much easier. Absolutely. Yeah, so we want to give a big shout out to uh, KCAA, NBC News Radio, who's yes. here broadcasting to the radio audience live right now. Thank you very much. Yes, San Bernardino Community College District. Uh-huh, KVCR, well, also the San Bernardino County Superintendent of Schools. We've got Cardenas, which provided an amazing lunch. Oh, it was delicious. Yes, amazing. PBS SoCal, who is also uh, recording this and redistributing it there. Kaiser Permanente. Yes, always an, a great place to also take your family to in the event that you get an ingrown toenail. Oh Not that it's happened to me, <laughs> but if it does, that's where you go. AT&T, <laughs> Inland Empire Magazine. And uh, Pepsi, too, by the way. Did mm. you get the Diet Pepsi and the Pepsi back there? I didn't, but I saw you going for it. I did. We had no espresso for me, but Pepsi, please. That will okay, do the trick. We want to uh, bring on over uh, one of our panelists here. Yes. Uh, actually, a couple of Diana our... Diana Rodriguez. Oh, we have the whole panel. Yes, bring them on over. Why not? Yes. Uh, bring them on over come here. On over. You Let's guys have a second Whoa, side. secondary oh. panel. Watch <laughs> out there. Careful around wow. the... Oh, wow. We You're so enjoyed that, the there panel. There we go. Thank you all for being up here with us. <laughs> all right, so we... It's a party up here. Yeah, here we go. Okay, in, so we come on here on. in the middle. There we go, there we go. Okay. You guys are the important <laughs> ones. I'm the... We're just the additionaries. Uh, uh, yeah. There we go, okay. Good. So, uh, you, obviously, you guys spoke about some very uh, uh, interesting topics, but especially some very impactful, and some, were, uh, as what you said here, people don't like to talk about. Uh, why do we have that problem to begin with? I think there's just a fear and a level of uncomfortableness that, you know, it's sometimes difficult to have those conversations. And as leaders, we need to be ready to have those crucial conversations with our youth and with our community so that we can create a awareness and ultimately prevention. And you know what, Diana Rodriguez, you said step out and step up. And you talked about how as a community, generally speaking, we don't take enough risks. What would you say to the person out there thinking, 
maybe I should do it, maybe I shouldn't. How did you leap from the comfort zone into the risk zone? Well, I think that, you know, many of us culturally grow up being told, don't take risk, play safe, so mm -hmm. to speak. But I aligned myself, or maybe some folks looked after me and saw potential and encouraged me to step up, you know, and that's what I hope, that the person sitting, listening, thinking, should I or shouldn't I, take the risk. I think you'll find out in most situations there isn't much you can lose and just the world to gain. Thank you very much. And, and you, we were talking again, all of you are amazing leaders. Uh, it's nice when we have leaders that also talk the talk and walk the walk, right? Not ones that just preach and teach and then go and do others. What though, with the talk that we've been talking about today, do you think can, uh, we could see more action in than what we're currently seeing? What can we do? Um, I think uh, continue to build relationships. I think that's where it really starts. That's the foundation to really get us, you know, moving forward. Is that you need? You can't do it alone. You have to, you know, look for alliances and build those networks. And I think sometimes we're a little skeptical about doing that because we don't want to ask for help. But but I think it's it's crucial that that we do that and we do it in a bigger scale. Very good. I love that. And then I, I can't help but I have to revisit what you guys talked about, legacy. And I remember you saying you're a financial aid advocate. Yes? yes. Okay. <laughs> so for that person watching thinking, I want to really push my students or I want to push my kids or my men mentee to do X, Y, Z, maybe apply to that Ivy League school. Uh, what would you say to that person that may feel intimidated by that whole process? I would say ask questions. There's so many processes and there's so much re there's so many resources out there available for students and oftentimes we just don't know. And so being able to be open and asking questions and always asking for help is the right step in the direction. Yes. And, and final, you know, we were talking about again uh, women and the empowerment and it's sad that we have to talk about this still, but as you mentioned earlier, it's very important to draw the line in the sand and say what is acceptable, not acceptable. I, I appreciate what you said about, you know, removing or a requesting to be removed certain pictures from the environment. What should women around the world uh, do when faced with that? Because there's so much uh, now that's being said, but then there's still pockets of communities where they may feel alone. They don't feel part of that collective. Yeah, I think it's important to find uh, somebody to that you do trust to share information with and then report. I mean, my situation occurred over 25 years ago and just utilizing a process th through Fair Employment Equal Housing, I was able to resolve uh, my matter and it wasn't as scary as one might think. And so um, just to demystify that, although it might seem really daunting to report, mm -hmm. it, it's actually not. It's really simple. And I hope that everyone out there, if any of you have experienced something similar, that you do report. And, and last but not least, because all of you women uh, obviously are inspiring others, I have to ask just down the line here, who inspires you in your life? My parents. My parents, they, they are the hardest working people I know, and, and I'm here because they chose to have me. Love that. I would say my parents as well. They instilled a lot of the values that I carry today. Um, but in terms of now, the support that I receive, definitely my family, my husband, and my children are the ones that are championing uh, for us to continue to advocate for our students. I feel awkward saying my parents because I always just call them mom and dad. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But I would absolutely have Madre to Madre and papa. <laughs> right? Yeah. But I would say my mom and dad who continue to overcome challenges and are just incredible role models. And then also my husband, you know, given uh, my career, taking me around, um, incredibly supportive and has really always put me first. Very good. And I would say my mother. She was a strong single mom, and she made sure that I went to college. And so I learned what I needed to do from her. She's a very strong Chicana, and so am I. And uh, not only did she make sure I went to college and graduated, she also did the same for my three younger sisters. So when it was time to pay it forward, I made sure she went to college, and she also was able to finish. So my mom. 
Well, we thank you, wow. each and every one of you, for sharing yes. your stories. Yes, talk about it's paying always, it forward. We all yeah. get to take a little bit of you today, so thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much. Again, if you want to continue the conversation with us, all you have to do is join us online before, after, during. All of this will be archived for your viewing pleasure. And we do recommend that if you find any bit of this encouraging to you, perhaps you're stumbling upon it for the very first time, you're saying, lead Latino education and advocacy days. What does that mean? Well, uh, you can watch this over again, and you can share it with your friends, family, yeah. on social media, get which we make it very possible. Get involved, and let's yes. get out of our comfort zone. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Was, and get out of your comfort zone and follow me at Aaron M. Sanchez <laughs> uh, on Twitter. I tweeted out the YouTube link of this as well. And if you retweet it, get the word passed along, we then you could do that. I don't think you've retweeted us, by the way. I need to do that. Jeanette. I yeah. really need to. Yes. I'm, I'm one of the old school souls inside. Uh huh. But, well, but I'm going to get on with it. With the new school social media. <laughs> I, I helped her set her up for her social media. Tweet Jeanette. <laughs> yeah, I need to get on there. We, we want to thank the California Teachers Association. Yes, let's thank them as well. City News Group Incorporated, thank you for helping out and spreading the word. Telemundo, Channel 52. Ooh, Telemundo. Yes, nice. they're in the house. Hispanic Lifestyle. Uh, always good to see uh, Richard Sandoval over there at Hispanic Lifestyle. What a great last name. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Ah, I get it. <laughs> Jeanette Sandoval, I'm a little slow on the, the uptake. The Education Trust West. <laughs> thank you very much for your support. La Prensa as well. Thank you for your support. Mercury. Ooh. Yeah, I wonder if that's... I think those are, that's my insurance. That's my insurance. So, <laughs> well, now it is. The other one was charging me way too much, so I saved on my... Isn't that a commercial? Okay. Uh, El Aviso, uh, thank you as well. Mi Familia Ooh. Latina. Radio Mujer Digital. Yeah. I'll have to tune in and see what that's all about. Hey, speaking of which, we have to say a very special thank you to those transcribing us right now below us, which is ai-media.tv. You guys wow, are amazing. Guys. We appreciate all of your help on letting uh, not only those that have hearing impairment, but also those that don't want to play the video wherever they're at and they can see it being written down live, yes. captioned. We want to say thank you for their services as well at uh, doing the amazing job that they do. I really don't know. I want to see. I want to get behind the scenes to see how do they type out what we say so fast. And if I go faster, do I make it more difficult for them to <laughs> caption me? I, I think the answer is the answer is no. But I, I don't know. I type this way. Inquiring yeah. minds want to see. I'm, yeah. I'm oh, you're still one oh, finger. It's terrible. So okay. yeah, I'm, uh, kudos right. to you uh, guys. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> we'll uh, get you a lot of times. Radio Mujer Digital as well. Thank you for uh, lending your support. University of Redlands. Ooh. I love that university. It's gorgeous, yeah. by the way. Very amazing. Uh, Gr California great radio. Latino Leadership Institute. Ah, yes. Thank uh, you for Upward your Upward Bound, University of Houston downtown, uh, and also AHRH Custom Wood Creations. Again, it takes quite a few to actually put this all together. And uh, each year, people come and uh, support more, and they say, how can I support? Well, we're glad you're asking because all you have to do is uh, reach out to Professor Enrique Morillo or find the Facebook page which is Lead Latino Education and Advocacy Days. Wherever you're seeing this at, just look at the little video at, at the top and then go and like that. And then and we're talking the so much about social responsibility and yes. how to get involved. This is a great, I think this is a great opportunity for those watching to, uh, to tune in, but also to get involved. Yes, so. absolutely. And we've had some great guests. And on the next part of our panel, which I'm really excited because quite a few of these ladies have been honored in the past years mm -hmm. uh, and and for what they do it is amazing they remember what I said earlier the Medal of Honor I was like what do you have to do to get one of these things and what do I have to do to get one well obviously these women have you'll hear their stories just a bit uh, and what they have done one of my favorite all the way from I think they gave it to her yeah in 2010 wow. Wow, I can't believe it's been that, that long for us. But yes, I remember when Sylvia Mendez got her uh, Medal of Honor. In fact, she's sitting down, yeah, right oh, next nice. to us, exactly, wow. as Jose Luis is 
uh, letting me know she's literally right there. He's like, take a picture <laughs> of her. He's getting starstruck right now. Uh, you can feel the feminine empowerment energy just rolling through here. Yes, but they shared her story, I remember, on the big screen because the uh, case was very big and uh, made it to PBS. And if you haven't already Googled her, I highly recommend you do so. Sylvia Mendez, go check that out. Then we've got uh, 2011 Lead Summit uh, Madrina de Honor. Mm -hmm. Dr. Judy Rodriguez Watson. Yes. I saw her earlier. She said a little hello. And hello, Judy. And she's, yeah, Yay. I know. Yeah, she, they're all they're sitting all right. <laughs> He's like, they're sitting right there. Don't talk about them too much because they're sitting right Aaron, there. I I'm like, I know they're right there. They're I have to say, for those <laughs> of you watching who have joined us in years past, yes. your Spanish is getting better every I, year. Right, I know. I'm starting to roll my R's. Yes. It's great. I'm kind of impressed. A lot of King Taco. <laughs> my gosh. And, and carne asada uh, with my sopes and uh, my... He can order food for I sure. I can, yeah. Or chata. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, we, we have... <laughs> <laughs> Which, by the way, that the one earlier, I, I, I'm waiting for his, English, his Spanish. We have to take him to some Mexican food to order because that'll help his pronunciation. Remember, uh, oh. it, that was, yeah. But, that you know, talk about being risky. That was risky of that him. Very that risky. That was the dean, I believe. Yeah, right? yeah. Yes. We got, dean, we need to take you to go get some Mexican food in order. Your, your Spanish J. will come Fink? out really good. Is it Fink? Yeah. Yes. Trini Gomez also is here. She was in 2011, the inaugural... Uh, Madrina de on oh, help me out. Ma See, I'm that third. What, what generation am I? Third generation? My As am I. As yes, am I. but your parents taught you Spanish. Mom, dad. Yeah, my grandparents did really, mm. but yeah. Yeah, and I and I, I get on parents now, you know, that that are like, oh no, they need to know English. I say, and they need to know Spanish. In the world that we live in, you think of the top three languages around the world. You've got English, Spanish, Mandarin. Yes, yes, Mandarin, Chinese, right? Yeah. So if you know those three, you can go anywhere around the world and not get lost, yeah, right? That's so right. I think it's it's a great thing to know. Yeah. I just want to go over. Oh, were you right? Go ahead. Oh no, uh, Josie Gonzalez, who's also here with us, Dr. Ellen uh, Clark, as well. In 2015, she got her uh, honor, Medal of Honor. Lillian Esther Hernandez for 2015, 2017 honorary Eloise Gomez Reyes. And this year, you heard her earlier, you'll hear her a little bit more, Martha Brown, who will be speaking all to us about uh, their, well, the, the, the title of today, Viva lo, La Mujer. I want to say something about that, though. Because Which, by the way, there's some people that don't speak Spanish. Yes, she was so moving to me. I mean, she yeah. said some things, and she has, I think it's time, actually. She okay. was so moving that we have to move He's like, along. end it, cut it, <laughs> right now. Okay, we'll be back with Professor Enrique Murillo. Okay, very good. <laughs> Thank you, Jose Luis. <laughs> that was thumbing through, thumbing through my notes. Okay. How's everybody feeling? Are we feeling good? Was today a good day? Very good. The, uh, the whole day started real strong in the morning. I just loved it, the, in every day, every session. Now, this is our capstone, which means it's the, the last little granito de arena, the, the last thing for today. Of course, um, it, what we're doing here is raising awareness, raising consciousness, right? Trying to get people to step in and to get involved. So at this point, I, it's my great honor to be up here with this very distinguished group of mujeres, right? Y que vive la mujer. I can, I don't, I don't get tired of saying that. Okay, we're going to turn over this featured capstone panel to the capable hands of Patricia Aguilera, who serves as a student services professional for. She is the Federal Work Study and the California Dream Grant and Loan Coordinator here at Cal State University San Bernardino in the Office of Financial Aid and Scholarships. She has a master's degree in public administration. Patty, all yours. Thank you, Enrique. Good afternoon. Um, 
And the, uh, my name is Patricia Aguilera, and I am a financial aid counselor here at the university. I'm one of the long-term, I think, university employees. I've been here almost a, a 30 years, and I stand, still stand here before you. <laughs> I have also had the distinct privilege to serve on the lead um, hospitality and planning committees with a great group of individuals and volunteers. Um, this afternoon, um, I will be serving as your moderator for the capstone presentation, Viva la Mujer, Nosotras las ma mas ma I'm sorry, Madrinas. Anyway, I am privileged to be uh, here among this beautiful group of women and sharing their stories today with you. We'll be um, going over um, uh, various questions, and at the end of each presentation, uh, we'll have a few questions um, for the audience to, to give us, okay? So basically, um, Latino girls and women make up one in five females in the United States, and by 2060 are predicted to form nearly one third of the total female population. As a fast growing and influ influential constituency, Latinas have made significant strides and progress in a number of areas. Yet, progress has been extremely slow and there is a long way to go to fully close gen gender, class, educational, and racial disparities. Latinas are incredibly entrepreneurial, and as the number of rate of Latino-owned businesses has increased eight times that of men-owned business, yet remains significantly underrepresented, especially among fort Fortune 500 companies. In terms of economic security, the disparities are leaving a growing portion still likely to live in poverty and a single heads of households still earning less in the labor market. For decades, too, Latinas have been more likely to lack health coverage among Americans uninsured and still have the least access to health care of any group of women. In terms of civic and political leadership, Latinas have a rich history of leadership in our communities, but remain underrepresented in all levels of government. As a group of Latina females start school significantly behind other females and without proper support and intervention are never able to completely catch up to their peers. Latinos graduate from high schools at lower rates and in any major subgroup and are the least likely of all women to obtain and complete a college degree. This capstone presentation will be offered by past and current lead events honorary chairpersons all strong advocates and activists themselves who have made significant contributions to our community, affectionately known as our Madrinas. The distinguished panelists of Mujeres will draw from decades of their personal and professional lives to discuss and shed light on their role, actions, and journey, working, empowering, and struggling towards social and economic justice, diversity, equity, educational labor equality, civic, political, human rights, and social change. Therefore, it gives me great pleasure to introduce the following panelists. Our first 2010 inaugural lead summit madrina, Sylvia Mendez. Our 2011 Lead Summit Madrina, Dr. Judy Rodriguez Watson. Our 2011 inaugur inaugural Federal Educativa Madrina, Trini Gomez. Our 2000. 15 inaugural Global Lead Summit Madrina, Dr. Ellen Riojas Clark. <laughs> Our 2015 Feria Educativa Madrina, Lillian H Esther Hernandez. I missed Josie over here. I'm sorry, I missed one. My apologies. Our 2013 um, Lead Summit Madrina, Honorable Josie Gonzalez. And now, last but not least, our 2017 Lead Summit Madrina, Honorable Eloise Gomez Reyes. Okay, so we're gonna start first with Sylvia Mendez. 
You are a civil rights champion, the oldest daughter of Gonzalo Mendez, a Mexican immigrant, and Felicitas Mendez, a Puerto Rican who fought so fought so you and your brothers could have an equal education. Mendez versus Westminster was a 1947 federal court case that challenged the practice of school segregation, and as a young girl, you were the lead plaintiff in this lawsuit. In this ruling, the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit held that forced segregation of Mexican-American students into separate Mexican remedial schools was unconstitutional and unlawful. This is a long landmark historical decision and as paramount requisite in the American system of public education and social equality. It must be open to all children by unified school association regarded, regardless of lineage. Madrina Silvia, as you continue with the legacy left by your parents to campaign for education, encouraging students to stay in school and to ensure that the importance of Mendes versus Westminster in American history, history will not be forgotten, will you please tell us about the role your mother and other community women played during the landmark desegregation case that bears your name? Thank you. Good afternoon. When I started this, <laughs> I'm so glad to be here and see all these students that are here today. Anyway, I have uh, to tell you that there was there is a book, 62 pages of all the women that were involved in Mendes. And I'm not going to speak about all of them. I'm just going to speak about three of the women. And the three women that have inspired me. One was my tia Soledad Vidari, that I always said she made a, a Rosa Parks stand before Rosa Parks. Because when we went to that school, and we were right there, getting ready to be admitted, and the clerk said, Miss Vidari, you can leave your children here, but your brother's kids will have to go to the Mexican school. My, my cousins, because we all know we all come in all colors, don't we? <laughs> my cousins had blonde hair, almost blue eyes, and the, and the lady said, you can leave your children here, but your brother's kids will have to go to the Mexican school. And what did my tia do? My tia Soledad Vidari, Mendez Vidari, she said, I am not leaving my children here. If you won't take my brother's kids, I am not leaving my children here, and I am taking them to the Mexican school. So she is one of my heroes. She took us home that day and told my father, and that's when he started fighting the case. So that's my number one, uh, one of my number one persons. The other person that I have always admired in the Mendez case, aside from all these other women that are in this book, was Miss Guzman. Miss Guzman was a lady in Santana that was fighting to get her child into a white school, really. And she had even hired a lawyer, but her lawyer failed her. Her lawyer failed her in getting uh, Billy into a white school, but she did join the Mendez case and eventually uh, got him into a white school. But she had started all by herself, just going to the, speaking to the superintendent and everybody trying to get her child there, even hired a lawyer, which she wasn't able to do. The third person that I have admired and who to me is my hero is my mother. <laughs> my mother, when my father decided to fight this case because he, uh, he wanted to be a farmer when we moved to Westminster, as you all know the story by now, uh, my mother is the one that had to run the farm and take care of all the 14 braceros, do all the cooking, take care of the packing house so my father could be out there. But aside from that, they, they, uh, she organized uh, a committee for, for all the children that was called, uh, I have it here, right here. And it was the Parents Association of Mexican American Children. And they would meet every week trying to decide how are we going to fight this case. And it was everybody, all the women, all the men there in Westminster joined in and would go to this meeting and they were trying to decide how are we going to fight. It wasn't until they found Marcus that decided let's make this a class action suit for everybody. So I've always uh, known that my mother was a very important part in Mendes. To me, my mother is the one that that I have to give the credit for me being here today because when she was dying in 1997, 
She said, Silvia, somebody has to go out there and tell the story about the Latinos, how they have always been so brave, how, how we have always wanted the best for our children. You need to go tell the story because nobody knew about it in 1996. Very few people knew. And she's the one that said, Silvia, you have to go out there and start talking about it. And it was her that inspired me to go out there and start talking about uh, the Mendes case because she knew that it was part of history and it was part of, of our culture, the Latinos, how we have always fought for equality and justice and how we always wanted the best education for our children. So I would say that she is my champion woman in Mendes versus Westminster. Thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you, Sylvia. Viva la mujer, viva la, our, our mamas, right? Yeah, <laughs> viva. All right, next I would like to introduce Trini Gomez. You are very well known and have deep roots and have been highly active in and across our regional communities. You have always placed a high value on education and social economic endeavors and in the collaboration of community groups working towards mutual goals and objectives. Oftentimes, the plight of Latino men dominates the discussion on Latinos in education. However, Latina fem females in particular face cultural, economic, and educational barriers to not just finishing high school, but entering and completing college. Latina females are often stereotyped into submissive and docile roles no ambition other than producing children or becoming homemakers. Madrina Trini, we feel you are a good role model for many of our young women. Will you please share about some of the challenges you had to overcome in completing your education throughout your life to achieve your goals? Good evening. Throughout my life, edu educated, education and training has helped me achieve my goals. I was raised by my maternal grandmother who was opposed to girls going to further their education. She was, she was old fashioned and very, very uh, conservative. When she, when she told me I couldn't go on to high school, I wrote to my dad. My, gra my maternal grandparents lived about 400 miles from my mom and dad. So I wrote to my dad and said, well, grandma says I can't go to high school. So dad came over and tried to tell her, Trini has to go to high school. I was the oldest of 12. He says, all my kids have to be educated. So she has to go to high school. So my grandmother said, okay, send her to high school, but I don't want her, take her. And that really broke my heart because <laughs> I was kind of spoiled, you know. <laughs> I was raised, you know, with my hat, my gloves, and just, and then to, to go home and share the back seat with 11 other kids, it was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> so I went to high school. My dad was, uh, a foreman for the Santa Fe Railroad, and so, and where he was living, where we were living, he got bumped. The, and the railroad, whenever you run out of uh, uh, seniority, you get bumped if somebody else wants your place. So he, he moved all the way to a place by Belen, New Mexico. But he had terrible allergies because of the cottonwood trees, and cottonwood trees are all up and down the Colorado River in Arizona. So the doctor told him, you've got to go as far west as you can near the ocean. So my dad started moving. I went to five high schools in four years. Wow. So uh, when, we, when we arrived in San Bernardino, it was in 1943, which was about the same time that I had graduated. When we got here, the superintendent came down to meet us children. The superintendent of the Santa Fe Railroad 
had carried me when I was a baby. So he, he asked all of us kids different questions. And he asked me if, uh, I, uh, if I could type. And I said, yeah, I can type 85 words a minute. He said, 85 words a minute, you're hired. So we got here like on a Thursday and I was, within a week, I was working. I was hired out as a car clerk at the Santa Fe yard office, which was a little shack underneath the uh, overpass on Mount Vernon, overpass bridge. There was a little bridge, there was a little shack and that's where the uh, trainmen uh, worked out of, the switchmen, the conductors. It was just a little shack. There were no, no bathrooms for ladies. Mice and uh, rats and uh, cockroaches ran all over <laughs> the, 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 the floor. We had three spittoons. And when I told my mom, mom, nothing but old men, but I'm gonna get good money. So I stayed on, <laughs> I stayed on and uh, like I said, it didn't, it didn't have any bathrooms for ladies. I had to go around to the, to the uh, breezeway. And of course, all the conductors, the trainmen and everything, you know, that, that they did, like whistle and just kind of tease me. And so I was not gonna go to the bathroom. So what I would do, I would not drink water and I would hold it for eight hours. <laughs> so, but there I learned how, I learned a lot of things. That was the beginning of my uh, education in, like I would say now, computer. We had, our data processing was the entering of the initial numbers and what the car contained into this great big book about this big and about this tall. They sat me in a stool and, and, little, and some books and I would enter all that information there. I also learned the uh, teletype. I learned how to, how to uh, do the, uh, the card programming. What did they call it? Um, keep punching, <laughs> keep punching. And so I worked nights for a long time. In 1945, I got married, I was 20 years old, and I took a leave of absence. I had two children, and my husband, my first husband, Josito Nieto Gomez, decided to go to college. He went to college to the uh, University of Mortuary Science and became a mortician. He became the director of uh, mortuary at Tilly's funeral home on 6th and Mount Vernon. But you know, not, not too many people were dying at that time. This was a young time. <laughs> <laughs> this was sort of a young area. <laughs> so they were paying him $5, five dollars a, a funeral. And he said, you know what? We'll never get any, we'll, we will never uh, afford to have a house. So he went back to school and he went to the to Los Angeles, to the uh, uh, Aeronautics University of Los Angeles, and Southwest University of Los Angeles. And uh, he graduated from there and he got a position at Norton Air Force Base in, in, into the uh, missile program. Uh, in the meantime, you know, we, we began to have, we bought a house. We could afford sending Anna our first Oh yeah, I went back to work. I went back to work to afford a house. <laughs> so <clears throat> then, <clears throat> well, we had a good life. We were able to send my first child, Ana Nieto Gomez, to college. And, and my, when my son also went to, he started in Valley, they both started in Valley College. And then <clears throat> Ana went to the University of Long Beach. In 1967, it was a very sad time for me because my husband died. <clears throat> and so it left me as a, uh, as a young widow taking care of my, I think she was 85, my mother was 85. She'd been living with me since she was 59. 
uh, took care of my mom. My, uh, I'd had my, I'd had Vanessa, who was was by that time nine years old. I took care of my mom, Vanessa, and I was head of household. And also, just about every other week, I'd go see Anna at Long Beach, and I'd go pick up my son at. Uh, uh, yeah, Pendleton, Camp Pendleton in San Diego. And I'd pick him up every Friday and bring him, bring him home and then take him back every Sunday night. In the meantime, during all these years that I was working for the Santa Fe Railroad, uh, I saw that I needed more education so that I could work days. I had been working nights, nights and weekends and and so I just wanted to see if I could make my life better. So I went back to school and I took shorthand to bring my shorthand up to speed. <clears throat> anyway, I, uh, I was uh, able to take care of my family. And then in 1976, I met Graciana Gomez. We married in 1978. And, um, by that time, he started a, a little newspaper who, uh, he started a little newspaper and I told him, why are, you, why are you hiring so many people? I can do this with one hand tied behind my back. <laughs> he said, I've been working for a big corporations and I can do this. So he said, okay, you're gonna be the, the ma office manager. So I became the office manager and we had the newspaper from 1987 to 19 to 2009. So that's been my life story. I've been going to school all, practically all my life. I sent Anna to USC, my grandson to USC, my youngest daughter to the University of University of California, U, in San Diego, and I've had. Good luck to send another granddaughter to Princeton, my other granddaughter to Harvard, and now she is working out of London. <laughs> so, <laughs> so anybody can do it. Just work nights, days, whatever. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Trini. That was a beautiful story, and I'm sure um, you are so proud of your children and your grandchildren. And basically, you set the mold for them, mm -hmm. and um, that's quite an accomplishment. Thank you. Tell them how old she is, if you don't mind. <laughs> Come on, she wants to know how old. And she's proud to say that she has lived 93 years today. Bravo. Standing. And she still rocks. <laughs> All right, next I would like to introduce our Honorable Josie Gonzalez. Josie Gonzalez, you have proudly have served as the first Latina elected to serve as supervisor for San Bernardino County. <laughs> And just this afternoon, we found out that covers 24 cities within the County of San Bernardino. Is that correct? Great. Um, so she has served this for a number of years, and prior to that, has served in numerous civic and governmental leadership roles and committees. You have championed issues important to our communities, including public safety, economic development, improved transportation, ending chronic homelessness, and environmental stewardship. You have stated that these key issues are best addressed through co cooperative efforts developed on federal, state, and local levels. So clearly women and Latinas in public service have both continued to break through in politics, are on the rise, and shown and have cleared impact on policy program and operations. 
Today's issues and problems require leaders that have diverse skill sets and innovation and can only come from a diverse ideas and players. Women and Latinas bring those skills, different perspectives and structural and cultural difference to drive effective solution. In short, we change the way solutions are forged in important ways. Madrina Josie, will you please share with us why it is so important that we keep pushing forward? Thank you very much for your very kind introduction. Good afternoon, uh, honorable assembly member. If there are any other electeds in the house, I don't see you, but I would definitely want to recognize you, honorable madrinas, and all of you students out there in any special organizations, welcome. It is a beautiful opportunity when we are asked to come before you and speak in a manner that might inspire, that might enlighten where you're at in this point in time in your life. It is imperative that we recognize that we must continue to strive in a forward motion because there are those such as the lives and the stories that you've heard and you will hear, such those as the lives in your own families and such the, uh, such lives as those in the pages that fill our history books who have sacrificed, who have been told no, who have been refused, who have been rebuted, who have been criticized, ostracized, and proverbially been looked upon as the underdog. And yet, ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you that before you I stand in the year 2018 as the proverbial underdog because those past underdogs never gave up. They'd be kicked around, they'd be set aside, and it was irrelevant. They got up and they stood up and they kept marching forward. And that is the secret formula. That is the super uh, mystical formula of when we look back in history and say, how did so-and-so triumph? How did they get this company to, be, to become so successful? How were they able to come up with this idea and succeed? Where I come from, and I believe where most of our ancestors come from, we come from a place where work trumped education. Education was for those that had money. Education was a commodity, was a, was a, was something you heard about. You did not participate. And it is that hard work, that four-letter word, work, that ultimately paved the way for those of us today who walk onward, who stand before you in order to be able to, to continue to build upon their hard work. Leadership, the, the type of leadership that we need is a varied kind of leadership, and it comes from a varied background. We don't want to all be the same. And leadership determines the kind of progress that ultimately is made. And we need all kinds of progress, therefore you need to see different backgrounds. Having and trusting in one's power of discernment to identify the optimal direction in order to achieve the desired outcomes is important. And you achieve that through your hard work and through education. You must learn to trust your instinct, you must learn to trust your level of accomplishment, 
You must learn to trust that what you think, that your cognitive thought is what ultimately will get you through. And what do I mean by through? I mean through till the end. Because ladies and gentlemen, God is good. God takes care of all of us. And he gives us the best gift. And the gift is the present. And it is the present, ladies and gentlemen, every single day that is the optimal opportunity for us to continue to move forward and achieve and continue to build our dreams, our hopes, and the future. Very simply put, it is imperative that we continue with an open mind and open eyes, have a broad vision. Because ladies and gentlemen, I will tell you that prejudice is still alive and well. It is just better camouflaged. And it takes your mind, not the color of your skin, it takes your mind to be able to get a good grade in your classes, in your tests. It takes a good mind in order to be able to outthink, outprepare, and accomplish said goals that you have set for yourself. This gift that we receive every day is the gift of the sacrifice that has been made over and over and over for hundreds of thousands of minutes and hours and weeks and years. That effort is the effort that opens doors and breaks more glass ceilings. It opens the opportunities for people like us to be CEOs, to be assembly members, to be senators, and with God's grace, maybe one day even president of, of the United States of America. <laughs> the type of leadership we demonstrate is not in what we say, but in what we do. In our actions, we determine the type of progress we make. If we act dumb, if we say dumb things, if we fail to get up every day with that present that God gives us every day, to do our best, if we fail to do that, we are determining our fate that day. We have to identify and strengthen our own powers of discernment to identify our optimal direction. What do you bring? Where did your family come from? How did your family struggle? What, did, what price did they pay that you today, like myself, are able to attend classes, go to work, live in a beautiful house with God's grace, be able to be a self-sustaining, independent adult. What do you bring to your life today that is a lighter load because of yesterday, but is a beautiful gift for tomorrow? Because ladies and gentlemen, especially you young ones that are here, those of you that are not parents yet, but one day will be, I tell you that right now you may not think about it, but you are carrying the torch. You are carrying the weight of the responsibility so that one day your children can step into your shoes, into our shoes, and be able to lead that torch. No different than the Olympic torch, that we might be able to light the way of the past so that people can see where we come from and light the way for the future that they may not stumble and that they may stand proud because we are part of a nucleus inside an atom that has had a beautiful explosion on society. I am so proud to be a Latina.
Quiero que sepan todos ustedes que es un orgullo muy bonito poder hablar nuestra lengua y poder ejercer dentro de nuestro trabajo, de dentro de nuestra profesión, la oportunidad de servir al público con honor, con orgullo y tener el empeño de poder ejercer un ejemplo para todos ustedes. Y por eso tenemos que seguir luchando. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you, Josie, for such an inspirational, motivational response. Okay, next, I would like to introduce Dr. Judy Rodriguez Watson. Judy Rodriguez Watson, you are co president of the Seal Beach based Watson and Associates Development Corporation and an ardent supporter of education. You co chaired California State University San Bernardino's Tool for Education fundraising campaign in 2006. The effort raid mo raised more than $3 million to equip the university's College of Education building with technology labs, clinics, literacy, and assessment centers. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> that currently serve the students and the Inland Empire community. In 2010, USB named its four-year-old public art program, the Judy Rodriguez Watson Public Art Project, in honor of your passion and financial support for placing art in open spaces here at Cal State and surrounding community and around the city of San Bernardino. Dr. Rodriguez Watson. Could you please tell us about the role of philanthropy in promoting education, and in particular, your women's touch in the public art spaces? Hola, buenas tardes. I am honored, honored to be here. This is amazing. Um, uh, Papi, thank you for that wonderful um, introduction. Um, I am um, honored to be here with these distinguished, inspiring, accomplished women. I admire and respect you all deeply. Um, I'd like to start actually uh, to speak to my younger self and you young youngins out there who are the future. You are defining the future. And um, as a young man, to my younger self, I, I, um, I found that I had struggles with reading, a very at severe dyslexia. I would uh, have to read things three, five times before I was able to absorb um, any lecture, any book, any reading, any material, any statistics, math, science, anything. Uh, they put me in remedial classes. Um, it. Uh, did something to my, you know, did something to me inside. And um, however, it also developed my sense of perseverance. I didn't realize that I had this complete, this incredible drive to try hard every day. Um, I uh, was also fortunate to be raised by a very loving and nurturing family. And um, our family, we uh, were very supportive and they had a lot of passion and um, they always encouraged us to think big. And, um, and so I very, feel very fortunate for that. And my daddy was always saying, dale la lucha. And in this case here, también viva la mujer. And he would always say that. I had three sisters and no um, brothers. And my father would say, oh my God, another daughter, yes. <laughs> so, um, as a youth, um, I, um, we didn't have, uh, we were, had humble, I had a humble beginning. And, um, but I always had dreams of doing good things um, to help people as much as I possibly could, but I didn't really kind of know how to do it. Um, and I uh, found that my perseverance and heart, my drive to work hard uh, put me in this place where I am now. Now for, not my, now for me as my not so younger side, um, in this area of thinking big and trying to persevere to do the right thing and help others, um, my husband and I 
um, became acquainted with the university and developed a wonderful relationship and rapport. And uh, we developed the, uh, the Judy Rodriguez Watson program where we do provide public art. If when you drive off the campus, if you look to your right and turn, make a right hand turn on campus drive, you'll see the, the pillars that we have, these beautiful ceramic pillars that are about maybe six by six and about 20 feet tall. They were um, um, a, uh, a design that was uh, developed by the art department uh, under the umbrella of Dr. Uh, Richard Johnson. And um, it was uh, remarkable in that the students, the, the master students, worked with the, uh, the, the, teach, the professors and they went to a, a, through a curricula to develop these, these pieces. And, um, but it also not only gave them an education in how to be, create art, they went through the process of designing the work, going through a semester of that. And then the next semester showing us maquettes of what they'd like to do. And then we went through an art jury. So it was quite a process. And so out there is, is you know, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears from these wonderful students. And um, so I hope you get a chance to look at those. Also in the city, we have these wonderful spheres that the master students created. And, um, and along with a, a few other things that I'm kind of proud of and may, hopefully you'll get a chance to see. Um, additionally, uh, Patti mentioned that we uh, developed the Watson Literacy Center. That is one of the areas that I'm most passionate and happy of and thrilled to be a part of. As I mentioned, I, dyslexia was a very, a very difficult um, issue for me. And um, with this program, we help children from K through 12 in their reading. They have one-on-one -on -one exposure, and they've some of the kids have grown. When they start the program, they uh, advance one, two, and three grades up going through this process, which is extraordinary, and I'm very proud of that. Um, now, I um, in relaying these 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 stories to you, I hope that it, I can impart to you and inspire, um, considering the challenge that challenges that you may have, um, to you know roll up your sleeve, dale la lucha, work hard, think big, and and just go for it. And um, I um, I am optimistic about you know, seeing these, these kids out here, and especially just within the last few weeks, watching these kids in Florida, and then the Me Too uh, movement. There's a revolution going around, and it's happening, all, that's affecting the entire world. And um, I, um, I see, you know, uh, particularly as it relates to the Me Too movement, I see women are really thinking about what they're saying, and and how they're interacting with other people. I see respect, a different sort of respect. It's, it's, it's tangible to what's going on now. And, um, I, uh, I, and then also to see women with women, how we're working together and trying to raise each other up instead of the other way around. And, um, and it's, it's wonderful to see, and it's wonderful to, to see it, um, this movement, this revolution uh, affect the entire world. Um, thank you for the honor of being here. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Um, in closing, I'd like to um, um, express my sincere honor in being able to speak here, and I thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Dr. Judy Rodriguez Watson, for sharing <coughs> your, your contributions in the beautiful arts throughout our campus and city, as well as the Literary Center. I was mentioning to her earlier that uh, through the Federal Work Study Program that I administer out here on campus, we employ approximately 50 uh, Cal State students to support the Literary Center, and it has been very successful for the last 10 years. So thank you. Yeah, 10 year anniversary. 
Okay, next, to my left, I would like to introduce Dr. Ellen Rehohatz Clark. Um, Ellen Clark uh, is a, was a professor at Metria of Bilingual Education at the University of Texas, San Antonio. You hold a PhD in Curriculum and Instruction, a Master's in Bi, let me put my glasses on, Bicultural Bilingual Studies, and a Bachelor's in Elementary Education and Early Childhood Education. You have embarked on dozens of successful, creative, multicultural, educational, cooperative learning, collaborative literature base, and curricular focused projects, programs, interventions throughout your career. You have received numerous awards, distinctions, and Hall of Fame inductions. I have a two-part question for you, okay? So the first part, Dr. Clark, what are some of the challenges and benefits you have experienced as a Chicana Latina university professor and pioneer? And then the next part of the question is, uh, what can and should be done to create more Latina school teachers, counselors, more Latinas in master's and doctorate programs, more Latina tenor, tenor line college and university professors and institutional leaders across the pipeline. Buenas tardes. So good to be here and absolutely delightful. I'm sorry all the young people left, but great to see everybody that is still here. Me encanta venir a California. It's always nice to see an environment that's different than mine in San Antonio, Texas, where I was born and I'm going to die. Yeah, <laughs> soy. So what I want to tell you, I'm going to answer the second question first. How do we increase the pipeline for teachers, counselors, tenure track professor? And that is to have more people that look like us teaching at universities, more people that look like us in positions of, of power to hire people like us, and more people at the, at the president's level to give vision or to articulate the vision of the communities so that more people are represented. Why do I say that? My area of research is identity. So one thing I've learned over my 40 years as a professor at UT is that identity is a singular factor that will make students successful if it's an elementary school, middle school, high school, and at the universidad. So identity is based upon who am I in terms of my ethnic identity. And I learned this from a, some other guy from California, Amado Padilla from Stanford, who set me off on this quest when he said, in order to learn, you have to know who you are. And I always thought it was the other way around. But long story short, in all my years of research, I have found out that sabiendo que quien soy yo, pues la, 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 la cosa más importante para mi carrera. So, what are my challenges? And I thought, I don't need to tell you my challenges. We heard them all this morning. The number of us is what, this much? The number of, of college uh, presidents is 2.9. In Texas, we only have one Latina, one Latina as a president of a university. So those are the dismal facts. I hate to deal in that, but then I, I, I learned, so gracias, Enrique. I learned that our, today, our stories are important. Mm -hmm. We do have to share our stories. I'm going to be 77. So one thing that I have learned is that I stood on shoulders, and I, as short as I am, <laughs> I am the shoulders for you to stand on. And you will be the shoulders for the next group that comes around. So what were my challenges? Well, I got a PhD late in life, 
back in, back in the 70s, there was no university around in San Antonio, so I would have to drive on a weekly basis to Austin, Texas, to UT Austin. That's two hours away, so I'd drive in the morning, come back at night. The crock pot was my best friend, as were my parents, because they helped me take care of my two daughters. And so, um, the challenges were many. I remember going to defend my dissertation. My committee was all what? White males. So I invited a white female, because that was the only other, there was no Latinas there, just to sit in and just to listen to my defense. So one of the old, old white males asked me a question. Yo no, yo no tengo pelos en la lengua, I can answer. <laughs> I can answer anything, but you know, and she said something very important earlier. I thought about it and I said, okay, do I do this? You know, I can talk it, or is this a trick? Is this a trick question? And believe it or not, it was what? A trick question. So my white women, uh, female professor says, Barney, you know there's no answer to that question. But you know what that taught me? It taught me one thing. I would never, ever do that to a doctoral student going up to defend a dissertation. But it also told me another thing. He, he was saying, I don't want you in my circle. That was it. I apply for a job. What happens? Don't get it. Da, 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 da. Long story short, I filed suit against the University of Texas system along with two other people and of course one in our favor except that I was not too smart. I could have gone for a three year salary and I thought it's a principle of the thing. So I, uh, I told my co two other colleagues we're going to do a thousand dollars a year. So we ended up winning three thousand dollars. Oh well it paid for my daughter's wedding. That was, you know, that was the, <laughs> <laughs> the other thing that I found out through that lesson of having to file suit is that there's an institutional culture. So, but I'm telling you that you, there are going to be PhDs, and I hope that everybody in this room will be one. There's room for all of us and more than what's in this room. So even if it's not an idea you've had, you better dadgum quickly think, I might be ready to be a, UT, a, a university professor. So the institutional culture is one that we have to learn what it is. So when I finally get a tenure track position, 10 years after my PhD, I'm told you have to write a book. And I'm going, wait a minute. I hadn't heard that one before. I thought we had to write referee journals. And this morning you heard um, Julie say it took three referee journals. Well, in my institution, thinking there were tier one, it was 12 articles a year. So the, professor, or the dean who told me, you don't need to write articles, write a book. Books don't count. So advice for you that are young, PhD, students don't write books until you retire like I am. <laughs> write refereed journals. And so if it's 12 of them a, a year now, it's going to be a lot more by the time you, you get up there. So learn what that institutional culture is. Know what the answers are so that you can pay your own way and also look to see what people like me, the shoulders you're standing on, ha learn from their trek. The other is if you're told that is not legitimate research, give me a break, baby. Anything is legitimate research. And what I found out that the most important research was that that dealt with my comunidades. So what were the elements that were striking us? And those are the things that we needed to study. So, very short, learn the institutional culture, get a PhD, find mentors. Mentors are the ones that are going to help you, even though nobody else looks like you. So of course, I was the only Latina 
in my whole department, in my whole college for a long, long time. But that's okay. Because one thing I found out is I know who I am. Yo sé quién soy. Yo soy la gran tamalera de San Antonio, Texas. <laughs> and, and I have a, a crown. I have a crown to prove it. And I've written, you know, seven textbooks, over 300 referee journals. So I, I'm A1, you know, type one. And, but my most popular, most read books are the ones on cultural studies that my comunidad reads and everybody's learning from him. So my next book, next time I see you, I'll be La Gran Panadera because <laughs> My, my next book in, in 2019 is going to be on pan dulce. Did you know that there's seven, 2,000 names for cada pan, de dulce, pan dulce? 2,000 names. So there's more than just conchas. There's also nalgas, in case you didn't know. <laughs> and, and, and you think I'm kidding. I'm having the most fun researching my pan Dulce book. So be on the lookout for that one. <laughs> but, but you know what? It's going to have a, it's going to have an impact because I'm taking the cultural wealth and think of this, the cultural wealth of our community and documenting it. So that's your purpose for new PhDs, for you that are going to be teachers is to know that you must develop the kin soy in your, in your students for, for success. The other is that I'm a yaya. A yaya is Chinese for grandmother, it's Greek for grandmother, and it's my, my name. So, I have two daughters, both of them engineers, and they were 0.5% of the Latina engineers when they finished school. And of course, they made a hell of a lot more money than I did as a tenured professor. I have four granddaughters, like you said, puras mujeres except for my husband and our two Dalmatians. <laughs> but my four granddaughters, the oldest one, I mean, hold on to your hat. I can brag, right? I can brag. She is getting her PhD in nuclear fusion engineering at MIT. Yeah. You can clap. <laughs> and, and that's the other thing I learned about stories is that we have to brag. I have another one who is at Princeton and getting her engineering degree. And then I have a 15 year old that's gonna end up in engineering. And then I have one just like me. She's in humanities. So it makes it all well worthwhile. But what I do know is that my daughters and my granddaughters would not be here if it wasn't for me, if it wasn't for my mother, if it wasn't for my grandmother, my grandmothers that I never met but heard about. But I also know that they're products of public school education, good public school education, of good teachers who understood creativity and the development of inquisitive thinking, and that they're products of being Mexico-Americanas, or as I tell them, yo soy Chicana, yo soy Mexicana, with a small M, not a big M, because I'm not born in Mexico, and I am a Latina. So you need to be able, this is what I tell my granddaughters, you need to be able to articulate who you are. Somebody says, where are you from? Honey, that question means you're not from here. So you say what you know. Do not take a label given to you by somebody else. But you learn all the labels and you select the labels that describe you. So gracias, adelante, and have a, I am looking forward forward, forward to seeing what all of you are going to become. And remember, you don't have to reinvent the tire, the, the wheel. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. You can call 
all of us here, but we are the shoulders and we are the ones that will support you. Mil gracias. Thank you, Dr. Clark. I'm looking so forward to your pan dulce, your next book on pan dulce. I am the proud owner uh, of an autograph edition of her tamale book, book on tamale, so highly recommend it. Okay, next I would like to introduce Lillian Esther Hernandez. You have served as the Regional Executive Di Director for the Parent Institute for Quality Education, also known as PICE, for many years and responsible for establishing and maintaining working relationships with local university presidents, community leaders, foundations, corporations, school superintendents, principals, and other representatives. You have been instrumental in successfully leading, sustaining, and expanding parent leadership programs, serving multiple communities and in multiple languages. You, also, you are also both an immigrant and a church pastor with a tremendous passion for helping others and have worked to empower women to overcome obstacles. Being that you work to empower women to overcome obstacles, and work with Latina mothers, most serving as a primary care provider in the family, all at different acculturation and educational levels. Madrina Lillian, with respect to various factors related to parental involvement and knowledge of schooling, tell us about some of the activities and barriers in greater parental involvement experience by Latina mothers' role with respect to instilling the value, the value and importance of education and expectations of higher education, be it parent-child or parent-school relationships. Buenas tardes. First of all, and I want to say thank you to Dr. Murillo, because in 2015, I had the opportunity to become the madrina, along with Padrino Jorge Hines. And uh, it is for me an honor to be here this afternoon, along with these beautiful ladies who really and truly represent the Latina mujer. Right? Yeah. All right? Yes. I am an immigrant lady. I cannot say that I'm a first generation, because my two boys are first generation. So I came to this country with my degree under my arm, knowing a little bit of English with the English accent. But I always say this, that not because I speak with accent, that means that I think with accent, but the accent is there. <laughs> it comes out. But then I heard someone says, and who in California doesn't have an accent, right? So first of all, I would like to acknowledge that a Latin, Latina mother a Latina woman, it's someone that treasures in her heart what is known as the American dream. By the way, the American dream is not only American, because we the Latinas, we the, the Hispanic women, from Tijuana to La Patagonia, you know, we have come in, to this country and we have come uh, with that dream that also uh, we believe that the dream is ours. Our mothers did. Our aunties did. Our abuelas did. So our friends. So do mine. I strongly believe that our kids could do better because then we as parents, you know, the, the Latina mamas, the ones that have to come to this country, the ones that immigrated to, to this country and did not know how to navigate the school system, which is, which is very hard for those of us that came to this country, uh, not knowing how the school system functioned, let me tell you, it's like a humongous monster. It's complex, it's intimidating, <coughs> right? There are so many obstacles in the way for, for mothers or for a familia Latina who just arrived to this country. But when we 
the ones that are already experienced some of the years and we learn the necessary tools we are the ones that could help other mothers to to help their children to succeed in life i don't know many mothers who do not value education i don't know many mothers who do not encourage their children to to by saying mijito uh, be good uh, behave or, or mothers who would say, um, and this is constant in our, in our Latino household, uh, portate bien, mijita, uh, estudia, mijita, échale ganas porque tú sí puedes. Am I correct? Yes. Right? That, th those are phrases that are very common in, our, in, the in the Latina familias. Well, let me tell you this. And this is uh, being working for Pique for so many years. Um, I have discovered this that once parents come to the PK program and they learn all they need to know, then those parents, they understand, you know, how the school system function, what is FAFSA, what is the college admission requirements, what is the difference between the SAT and the SATs, what are the difference between the uh, different universities uh, system, community college, the UC, the UCs, the, the uh, uh, private colleges. Once the parents, have the necessary tools, those mothers become empowered and start telling the, the students, you know, their kids, you can do it. Because at that time, parents have the necessary information to push students. I wanted to, to say two things tonight, uh, this afternoon. With the Latina side bicultural, we are bilingual. Some of us, like these beautiful ladies, don't carry accent. Some of you might have a slightly accent, other ones, you know, mid accent, but some of us very strong accent, right? But once a mother, it's empowered. Once a mother know, you know, that it doesn't have the fear of the unknown, that mother, it's able, capable to tell their children, you know, take advantage because there is opportunities for you. The second thing, and I want to end with this uh, to all of you, is that the Latina mothers that already know the knowledge should help other mothers to help their children to succeed in life. It is amazing to see mothers that work two, three jobs, that get up at early in the morning and they come late home, they're providers, but they have this message for their kids. Mijito, échale ganas. Hijita, échale ganas, porque tú puedes. We came to this country because we heard that was, this was the land of the opportunities. But when parents are in power, when they have the necessary tools, then they can take advantage of every single opportunity that is available out there. Thank you. Thank you, Lillian, and I love your beautiful accent. I wish I had. Okay, lastly, we, I would like to introduce the Honorable Eloise Gomez Reyes. Your volunteer work and leadership in the community started long before you became an attorney and long before holding your current elected seat as member of the California Assembly. You received your law degree from Loyola Law School and not long after became the first Latina to open her own law office in the Inland Empire. As a young girl, you struggled alongside your family, working every summer in the fields, picking onions, grapes, working hard to earn money to pay for school clothes and supplies. You have credited those early experiences for providing the strong work ethic that defines you today and help to appreciate the work of so many others who even today must work long and hard hours to support their families. Your life, career, and passion are defined as helping others less fortunate and being of service to those who have needed protection and assistance. You have assisted injured workers, including workers' compensation and personal injury, unselfishly dedicating much time, treasures, and talent, and helping the indigenous. As we know, Latinas face formal structural barriers to entry and success in labor market and workforce. And we are also incredibly entrepreneurial as the number rate of Latino-owned businesses has increased eight times that of men-owned business yet. 
Yet progress has been extremely slow and Latinas are faring much more poorly than their counterparts from other ethnic racial groups still earning less than 60 cents for every dollar. They also have the least access to health care of any group of women and are still more likely to live in poverty as single head of households. Madrina Aloise, what are some of the initiatives currently challenging the status quo either in labor movements or among state level leaders in helping women and Latinas better achieve economic security and social mobility? Thank you, Patricia. Wow, what a group of women, my goodness. Amazing, just absolutely love this. One of the things that I think that all the women have in common, and I was, I was listening to the stories, many of the stories I already knew, but some were new stories to me. What was amazing to me is that every one of the women here, we all had a dream. We wanted to do something, we wanted to be somebody, but not just for ourselves. It was to be able to help the next group that would come after us. It was to, to teach the younger women, the students. It was to teach the parents. It was to be able to do the philanthropical work, to, to file the lawsuits that would win. Now, Trini did not mention, but Trini, weren't you the first woman at Santa Fe? Yes. She sure was. It was all men there. She told you there were no, no bathrooms for women. That's because she was the first woman to work at Santa Fe. Yes. Now, what's special about the fact that we're all madrinas is that if we're the madrinas of LEAD, that means we're all comadres. Please meet all of my best friends, my comadres. Most of you know what a comadre is. Well, I will tell you that um, some of the things that we are trying to do since arriving, for me, in the state assembly is making sure that the laws that we pass and the comments that are made in that state capital reflect our values. Some of the areas that are of greatest importance are early childhood education. If we know that a child's brain is developed and those early years are the most important, it seems so simple to me. Invest the money so that we can get that education for the children. If we say that by third grade, if a child is not reading at third grade level, there's a greater chance that that child is gonna end up on the, in the pipeline to the prison system, invest the money so that by third grade, every child is reading at third grade level. These seem like such simple solutions, and yet we're still arguing about them. We're still talking about, our, we're still trying to convince our colleagues about making sure that when we put together our budget that it includes that money that is needed for those areas. We shouldn't have to be doing that, but that is what we're doing. Community colleges, it, it's, as some of you may know, I started at a community college. I did have a full ride to USC from, from high school, uh, but my dad being my dad, and I love him dearly, said, mijita, Donde vas a vivir? Where are you going to live? In the dorms, Dad, in Los Angeles. No, mijita, you're not leaving the house unless you're married or you're going to the convent. So I did go to San Bernardino Valley College, and I got my AA degree in two years. I was on a mission, worked up to three jobs while I was going to Valley, then told my dad, okay, Dad, here's my AA. That's as far as I can go. They're holding my scholarship. I'm going to USC. Andale pues, mijita, la bendición. And of course, he cried, I cried. But there I went on to USC. Uh, was a resident advisor at USC and worked really hard. Worked another jo two jobs in addition to being a resident advisor. Got through that and then on to law school. Now, my roommate in law school, I was smart. My roommate worked in financial aid. <laughs> so I said, Rebecca, tell me about all the scholarships available. And she would tell me about um, all the scholarships. 
And there were many organizations looking for Latinas and Latinos because there were so few of us. And sometimes that's what we have to do. I tell students, go to Harvard, go to Yale. They don't have Latinos there. When I was at USC, they offered me, again, a full ride where I would, because I, I wanted to go to law school. They said, you can go get your, uh, your MBA and your law degree in four years. And I said, leave home again? My dad would never let me. So I didn't. I don't regret it because staying here in my community, this is the community I love. Plus, I met my husband, Frank. This is, the, this, the, the <laughs> <laughs> so what are some of the things we've done? Community colleges, thanks to my colleague, Miguel Santiago, the first year of community college is now going to be free. The, the governor signed that this last year. I, I'm very pleased to tell you that I had introduced legislation that would provide $5 million for our bilingual education, for our teachers because many of them had to get recertified. And there were many who were doing the job of a bilingual teacher but weren't getting paid because they didn't have the certification. Well, I found out while I was up in Sacramento is that in addition to having your bill going, it's on its way going through committees, you also have the, the option of requesting a budget item. Okay, how do I do that? We put in a request for $5 million, Lo and behold, guess what the governor signed? A budget that included my $5 million for bilingual education teaching. I also introduced last year a bill that would provide equity plans for our LGBTQ and our homeless students. We do have equity plans at community colleges for other protected uh, groups, but those are two groups that, that had not had any protection. That went through the committees. I, you know, you have to go through the whole process, and the governor signed that bill as well. <laughs> this year, my poor staff—they worked so hard. I, I um, was told that we can introduce a total of 50 bills in two years. Seems like you know, nobody's going to do that. <laughs> my first year, I did 19. And of my 19 bills, nine of those were signed by the governor into law. Uh, in addition to that, we also had a number of House resolutions that the governor signed. This year, I have introduced 26 bills. I'm very proud of all of my bills. They're all like my babies. And we're going to work them through all the way to the end. One of those has to do with student financial aid, helping our dreamers make sure that they are applying for the FAFSA application, making sure that they know every option available to them when it comes to, to, to funding, specifically with the California Dream Act application and others like that. I've also joined as a joint author with my colleague, um, Jose Medina from Riverside. He has introduced a bill that will require that ethnic studies be taught in the high school as a required course. Yes. Now, Judy, I really appreciate that you talked about the Me Too movement. We're in the middle of all of this. And I have the distinct honor of having been appointed by the Speaker of the Assembly to sit on the Joint Committee on Sexual Harassment with our senators, our uh, assembly members, there's a group of eight of us who will now have, we've been taking testimony and we will be putting together the policies and procedures for the state of California employees regarding sexual harassment. I'm very proud that I get to be part of that as well. So while I've been taking, we've been listening to all of this testimony, I realized that if you have been sexually harassed, you have only one year to file your claim. And for many, especially women, some, some people tell me, well, Eloise, there are men that are also sexually harassed. That is true. 87% of those who are sexually harassed are women. So oftentimes we talk about the women. So the bill that I introduce will provide not one year, but three years to file your lawsuit or file your claim for sexual harassment. 
Sí. I'm really proud to be part of this freshman class in the State Assembly. In this class, we added five Latinas. We doubled the number of Latinas in the State Assembly this last term. And what's what, the best part of it, personally, is that I'm a freshman. I'm part of the freshman class. And the truth is, it's been a long time since I've been a freshman. <laughs> so I absolutely love being part of that freshman class. And because of my 35 years of experience as an attorney, there's so much more that I get to bring in. Now I have younger colleagues, much younger. They get to bring in a different experience. We all bring something to the table. If you're younger, you get to bring those experiences that you're experiencing right this minute. So your opinion is very, very valuable. If you're older and you've had other experiences, you get to bring that to the table. It's the diversity that is key to anything that we do for the state of California. So I'm very proud to be part of that diversity. But that diversity, even at 10, it accounts for only 8% of the entire state legislature that are Latinas. We have no state senators right now. We did at one time have up to four state senators. We have zero right now. We do have a few who are running and we're really looking forward to having them win so that we can include them as part of our troop. Now, I, I will tell you also that um, having the voice of our millennials and Generation X is extreme, or Generation Z, what is it? Z, X, all of it. <laughs> One of the seminars we put together was Dream Big IE. And this was specifically for our millennials, for the younger people. We wanted them to tell us, because sometimes as, as we get older, you know, we, we understand the institutional rules and, you know, we, we work within the rules. But by having the younger people come, they have no, 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 border, no borders, they have no limits. And they came up with some magnificent ideas. And I will tell you that one of those I'm really proud of what they did, and so because my, our, our uh, county supervisor, Josie Gonzalez, is a supervisor in my district, Senator Connie Leva is a senator in my district, it's one of those projects that now the three of us are working with the community to make sure that that comes to fruition. It's those partnerships that count so, so much. I want to, to end today by sharing with you uh, one of the things that, that uh, it's a privilege that I get to have, and that is that as a state assembly member, I get to speak for the state of, Sa state of uh, Sacramento, I was going to say. I get to speak for the state of California. I get to speak for the state assembly. I get to introduce resolutions that all of my colleagues get to vote on, and oftentimes many of them get to speak on. So on March 7th, I introduced assembly concurrent resolution 194, which declares the last week of September, uh, the last week of March as lead week. And I'm very proud to share copies of this. We did bring extra copies. So I thank you so much for the invitation. Ahijado, donde estas mi ahijado? Allá está mi ahijado, mi ahijada. Thank you so much for the invitation to be here with you. It's such a pleasure to be here with you, to share just a little of what I have learned. And I've got to tell you, I'm looking forward to having all of you up in Sacramento. Thank you. Wow, I'm honored. This is a, a panel of a wealth of information that they shared with me, with all of us today. Um, before we, um, we're gonna take a couple of questions from the audience in a few minutes, um, but I just wanted to share that it has been a, an extreme and a great honor to stand within these beautiful Latino women. Normally, um, well, along with Enrique, and I'm gonna say Rob too, um, we're his long-term um, lead committee members of which usually I'm in the background, in the back, in the back 
in the background with Rob telling you know, basically telling Enrique what to do. But um, <laughs> I normally would not do this. Um, I, I was a little I was a little scared and frightened, but um, like I said, I have been. It gives me great honor to be among these women and all their accomplishments that they have done, and I'm proud to stand and sit among you. Okay, so next, um, we're going to take a couple of questions from the audience before conclusions this afternoon. Barbara Babcock, Judy, I love you to death. And of course, Judy, Josie. Assemblymember Eloise Reyes, you must talk about what you did for our Fine Arts Commission and for our city with the Rosa Parks statue. It made such a difference. I thank you. And tell us what you did. Thank you so much, Barbara. Uh, the city of San Bernardino, uh, very specifically the ba Black Culture Foundation, for about 10 years has been trying to raise money for a Rosa Parks statue uh, at the state building. The state building had, was already named after Rosa Parks. And so they called, a number of people reached out and asked if I could help them provide the funding. We found out how much was still needed. And just as I lobbied for my five million in the, the budget for the bilingual education um, training, I also put that amount, the amount that was needed for the Rosa Parks statue, and the governor signed it. So we got the rest of the funding, we got the statue. Um, it is now, we had the unveiling just a few months ago. It was one of the biggest events in our community with over 3,000 people in attendance. I was very proud of that. Thank you for bringing it up, Barbara. Thank you. We have time for another question. Hello, my name is Marina Jimenez. I work with the San Bernardino County Superintendent of Schools Office. About a month ago, I was attending a conference in San Diego, and one of the speakers really um, asked this question or made this statement and it really had me thinking and I wanted to see who would like to respond to this it was diversity is is being invited to the dance but inclusion is actually being invited to dance what would anybody like to re what does that mean to you how can we overcome how can we be included in that choreography Have you ever been to a wedding or to a party <laughs> where everybody gets up and dances? Yes, so La, you La Linea. That's right. You look Remember around La Linea. and the, the, you, you're waiting for someone to take you out. Sometimes you just go out and you invite somebody else, some of your comadres, to go out and dance with you. <laughs> That's very true. Thank you. Anybody else? I think that's the answer. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> the answer is you ask someone to dance or you make someone dance. Dance. <laughs> okay, uh, we have time for one more question. I'm going to speak on behalf of the men that are All right. scared to get up here. First off, I want to thank you for uh, honoring my mother, who's no longer with us, but just the fact she's here with us. I'm not going to cry. Um, my question is for the professora. How, or anyone who wants to, wants to answer the question, how, uh, as men, can we continue to support our women uh, in all the work that they do as by, by being allies? I have my own you know, thoughts about it, but I want to hear uh, your thoughts about how we can continue to be allies, not only allies, but activists in, in the current movement, but, but in general. How, how can we support you um, and women in general? Well, I was just going to tell you, I think you can answer that question. Uh, in terms of what men can do. But having worked with, uh, as we all have had experiences, that this has not been part of our, our, our socialization sometimes. I had students who would have to study locked up in the bathroom, or husbands who would tear up the books and we, because they didn't want them to study. So I guess the answer to your question is that men should speak with men and teach men what that, what, how they can support 
uh, the women in the family. I think someone this morning, I learned a lot on this session. I, lo I loved somebody said um, that the man is the head of the household and I was groaning. I thought, what the hell does that mean, you know? <laughs> but, and then she said, because women are the center of the ho home. So I think you men, it's your responsibility to do this now. We have so many years done that. We need to take care of ourselves and take care of other women and to ensure that the women who do have husbands who understand take that message to other men who will listen to the men. That's a very simplistic answer. That's my answer after ya cansada and all, of, all that stuff. So somebody else I'm sure has a better answer. All right, let's see how we approach this. I believe that the male gender in the modern society must continue to be a man, to be a man and to be the man. It is imperative that we recognize, especially within our culture and other cultures, that we honor and respect the men in our lives. If we are to enable a balance to take place, in today's world, the male must be strong enough, must be man enough to understand that his place is sacred. It is important as the head of the family, and the man must be kind, and must be understanding, and must be faithful to good, positive, character values and the fact that the men have to quit running away and leaving their children behind and that there has to be a line drawn in every society in every culture and it's and it is that we will respect each other and we will honor each other and that when love isn't as healthy as it should be, you go back to that respect. You go back to honoring. And it's not about how much you can cuss someone out or how much you can put someone down, whether it's a man to a woman or a woman to a man. It's how much can you learn to understand that life is extremely difficult and that it is by having an open mind and an open heart and standing still when the storm comes around because there are many, many storms. The problem is that in the midst of those storms, people forget to hang on and they let go and they let their children go and they let their women go. And, it, and all of that has forced women to become as competitive and as driven in order to be able to get our children ahead. That barn door and that horse left a long time ago, ladies and gentlemen. I love the fact that you asked this question. We now, we as women, need to remind all good men, all men, even the bad ones, because they're out there, honey, you know that. <laughs> that if you want a good woman, you gotta be a good man. And God is always first. Thank you. Thank you. Enrique? Sure, go for it. 
You know, one of the things, I, when we were in the protest for our DACA students because of what number 45 had done, and we were all, you know, doing all the protests, one of my DACA students came to me and said, the best way you all can help is to allow us to be the spokespeople. Don't, don't pretend to speak for us. And I think the answer would hold true for the women, that women, we're strong, we, we can do anything. And as you, as you try to take a role with the women, just remember that the women can lead and sometimes, oftentimes, will lead. So just like my DACA students tell me, don't pretend to speak for me, then I would say the same thing. Okay, we're good. Make sure everything's good. Friends and colleagues, uh, it's time for us to sign off now. Um, today we're happy to report that we've stood strong once again, our ninth year, um, and we've exceeded even our own expectations. Um, thank you to each and every one of you, especially those who stayed to the end. Of course, our, uh, our media folks, and we're still online, right? We're still online. Um, today was yet another grain of sand. Como se dice en español, un granito más de arena, right? So I, at this point, I want to remind all the lead planners, lead volunteers, any padrinos that are out there, friends and colleagues, to join us for our annual group picture. So we can take our picture up here. And, um, and then we'll, we'll turn it over to our, uh, to uh, Aaron and Jeanette, so to sign off there. Y con eso nos despedimos for now. Corín Colorado, este cuento se ha acabado. Hasta la próxima. Gracias. Well, it's another year. Yes. Done. Nine Sealed, years. wrapped up, packaged. <laughs> Beautifully wrapped. Beautifully wrapped. With feminine Take wrapping. Thank you. M much, <laughs> yes, with a nice little bow on top. Yes, I love uh, it. It was a fantastic event. I have so many uh, good memories from this, some great speeches, some things I didn't know. I like what was brought up. You know, sometimes men kind of complain, well, how come they don't include us in that uh, sexual harassment? Well, 87% end up being women. That's very high. I didn't high. know that, actually. Oh, my goodness. It's very high. Yeah. And uh, so, rightly so, great time that we had here. I know I am, uh, I've got questions. I've got more questions. And I'm sure the dialogue will go on. Oh, absolutely. And let's tell the viewers how the dialogue can continue. Yes, you can continue to follow us here on Facebook and online. If you want to participate in next year's sessions, make sure to sign up at LEAD Latino Education and Advocacy Days. Also, Cal State University San Bernardino. We want to say a big thank you for yes, hosting this each and every campus. year. Yes, it's, if you have not come out to see it, you've yeah. got to schedule that. Uh, I know a couple people that said that they uh, want to come here next year. Yes. Yeah, because, you know, all the great stuff they're doing here. And a few alumni uh, out in the foyer were saying that they loved that they came here. Yes, so, exactly. Great school. So we want to say thank you to Professor Enrique Mario, who does this every year with the entire team. We also want to say a big thank you to the team behind the camera, those of you often yes. don't see. If you don't see them, that means we're doing a good job. They're doing a good job. <laughs> Yeah, well, they're doing a good job because, you know, but we're good doing a good job keeping them outside like my Theo over there who likes to get in the camera and be like, I'm here. See, it's, he's already <laughs> starting. He's already starting. Yeah. So, and we want to thank James Trotter as well, yes. which, by the way, just so you know, he also got one of these medallions. Yes, yes and you got did. a medallion. I did. With I one end, not two ends. We my need name to is too correct long. that. Yes. Too long for Everybody's it. Everybody's Jeanette, J-E-A-N-N. E T T E. So just so you know. He's like wrap it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So we appreciate each and every one of you. Thank you for joining our 2018 Latino Education and Advocacy Days. I'm Aaron Michael Sanchez. I'm Jeanette Sandoval. We'll see you next year at 2019, where it's 10-year 
Summit. Wow, amazing. Que Can't vive la mujer. Yes. Sí. 